innovation. Discovery. Action. Altruistic. Opportunity. Innovation. Connection. Engagement. Progress. Cooperation. Innovation. Open minded. Transformative. Innovative. Digital solution platform. Realization of brand. Thanks to Copen, we were able to approach the concept of circular economy in Senegal and meet the actors of this domain in the Senegalese context. To have a sustainable and independent economy has increased the reliability and the delivery of organic waste, so we are able to recycle much more waste as before. Hello and welcome to the Kupen Summit, Voices of African Innovation. For those of you new to the summit, this international event is dedicated to the Kupen Initiative, a project of innovation for development that is promoted by Fondazione Cariplo and Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo, two of the largest Italian foundations with origins in the banking sector. Kupen is a participatory open innovation process for implementing impactful solutions between Italy and Africa by facilitating partnerships between Italian NGOs and Italian and African innovators. Kupen took action in three areas of interest within three relevant SDGs. SDG 2, Zero Hunger. SDG 3, Good Health and Wellbeing. SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. The projects carried out under the Kupen Initiative were implemented in eight African countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Senegal. Today, we will meet the teams that implemented projects linked to the outputs and outcomes of the SDG 2 and 12, namely Zero Hunger with a focus on sustainable food and agriculture and responsible consumption and production with a particular focus on the circular economy. The Kupen Initiative is managed by Cariplo Factory in cooperation with these foundations and the collaboration of the Tiresia Research Group of Politecnico di Milano that contributes with monitoring and evaluation of the projects, Jenga Lab and F5. Before we start, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to thank the organizers for bringing together different stakeholders from the private sector, academia, civil society, and the United Nations Rome-based agencies. IFAD is committed to fostering and supporting innovation. Our, our world faces today many and complex challenges. Globalization, climate change, environmental degradation, migrations, the spread of communicable diseases and conflict are just some examples of evolving challenges and opportunities confronting rural people, people, women and men. And development practitioners constantly face new challenges and many good practices may quickly become obsolete. Making a positive and lasting impact on rural poverty requires the capacity both to implement tried and trusted and tested practices and also to respond to new challenges and opportunities as they emerge. In other words, it requires the ability to innovate. Despite global progress towards the SDGs, Many countries and regions are lagging behind, and social and economic inequalities are growing almost everywhere. This situation calls for new approaches to eradicating rural poverty and a better understanding of its challenges as seen by the rural poor. Earlier this year, IFAD adopted a new definition of innovation to ensure alignment of our initiatives and investments in innovation with IFAD's mandate. IFAD's mandate is investing in the rural poor. IFAD now defines innovation as a new process, product, or approach that adds value and delivers a sustainable, equitable, inclusive, and or new contextual solution to rural development challenges. For IFAD, the most important innovations are those that impact rural poor directly. IFAD aims to catalyze the generation, testing, and scaling up of solutions that have the potential to contribute to deliver equitable, better, and greater impact for the rural poor by leveraging on learning, strategic partnerships, digitalization, and the implementation of suitable tools and guidelines. We do this by fostering idea origination via innovation challenges and by supporting a culture of innovation and a systematization of innovation by design that enables ideas to be originated, tested, adapted, and scaled up. 
If it adopts an approach to innovation based on the lean startup methodology, behavioral insights, and the use of the UN Innovation Toolkit, which delivers instruments to design innovation based on five main pillars, strategy, partnerships, architecture, culture, and evaluation. We aim to make investment decisions based on learnings, data and evidence from research, and to adopt a human-centered and impact-driven approach in all of our innovation initiatives. If it prioritizes partnerships on innovation based on our common values to find solutions that contribute to achieve global rural prosperity, equitable, sustainable, and inclusive development through better targeting, capacity sharing, monitoring, and evaluation data, evidence, and of course, timely financing. I'm looking forward to the contributions by our partners and speakers today. So let's take a look at the agenda and the digital platform that we are using to host the event today. Thank you. So on your left, you can find the different areas of the digital space, which are the main stage where I'm speaking from, the reception and the sessions, which are separated rooms where we will all have an opportunity to go into the networking sessions. On the right hand, instead, you have a chat where you can contact the other guests and ask for one-on-one -on -one meetings. During the day, we will have several networking sessions. So to access the sessions, you just need to click on the left on the bottom sessions and select the room related to the project you are most interested in. During lunchtime, you will also have uh, an opportunity to book one-on-one -on -one sessions through the, through the chat on your right. In case you have any questions, please do not, do not hesitate to let us know um, by posting on the chat directly. I am now pleased to introduce our partners. Fundazione Claripo, Cariplo is a philanthropic organization aiming to promote and support in, uh, initiatives that work towards the common good and aiding individuals to fulfill their full potential. Fundazione Cariplo operates through philanthropic areas. These areas are arts and culture, environment, scientific research and social services, and they pursue also nine strategic goals. Please join me as we welcome Claudia Sorlini, board member and vice president at Fondazione Cariplo. Claudia is professor emeritus of agriculture, agricultural microbiology at the University of Milan, where she used to lead the faculty of agriculture. Claudia was the main promoter and coordinator of the establishment of the faculty of agriculture at the University of McKinney. She has been a member of scientific governmental committees on environment, agriculture, and cultural heritage, and is the former vice president of the Italian Touring Club and a member of scientific steering committees at the European Union Expo 2015. Claudia, it is an honor to start today's event with your speech. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, pleased uh, to welcome you uh, to the COPEN Summit, also on behalf of Cariplo Foundation. And thank you, Ms. Morales, for the introduction, and thank you all for accepting our invitation. As uh, Ms. Morales mentioned, the COPEN project has been promoted by Fondazione Cariplo and Compagnia San Paolo. Uh, despite the fact that this foundation focuses their effort primar primarily at local and, and national level, they are aware that in an increasingly global world, their actions need to be connected with all the other parts of the planet. This is why both foundations support also international cooperation initiatives in, develop, in developing countries. The goal of today's event is to share the, the experiences that were developed during COPEN. Within COPEN, we have experimented a lot new working methodologies and innovative partnerships led us to 20 grounded proof of concepts. Uh, concepts. Uh, we uh, would like to hand over the pilot of solutions to the international and Italian community. We hope that the proof of concepts that we have already tested and also validated through the co cooperation with local communities will support the local ecosystem, players, and all international development cooperation stakeholders. Our wish is that these experiences 
will become a common value at the service of other communities. Secondly, allow me to recall uh, Copen uh, ambitions. This path was not started to invent new solutions. Copen's goal was to address and try to solve uh, um, challenges through already existing innovative solutions. Copen helped this solution come to light to reveal and match them with the communities and actors of cooperations. Uh, during the first experience of Copen data, we learned that we must stimulate the cooperation between two apparently distant sectors because this cooperation is crucial to build and deliver successful co-participation participatory open innovation process. Those NGOs and innovators can speak a common language, the language of social impact and the solution can suit the challenges and the implementation contests. I would like to express a heartfelt thanks to all of you that are here today, to our partnerships made NGOs and innovators, to Cariplo Factory that managed the implementation of the entire COPEN process, uh, to Jenga Lab that contributed with its technical expertise, and finally to Tiresia the research center of the Polytechnic of Milano, responsible for the impact assessment of COPEN. Last but not least, let me say a warm thank you to the guests who have generously accepted our invitation to join us today and share the valuable insights. The moderator, Gladys Morales, of the International Fund for Agriculture Development, the keynote speakers, Caroline Legro of the World Food Program. I think that Carolina now is very busy in the, uh, during this food crisis. And uh, um, Amelia Cucci of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and Massimo Torero of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Their outstanding knowledge and experience along with the organizations uh, they represent are a source of pride and inspiration for uh, all of us. It gives evidence to the quality of the work that we have carried out over the years. I trust their presence here today may also be a sign and good omen of the great opportunities awaiting us and our partnerships. Enjoy the Copen Summit and let's stay connected. Claudia, thank you so much for those institutional remarks. I have to say that the honor is all mine to be here with you and to be associated with uh, an initiative that uh, has uh, not only launched more opportunities for innovation to happen in several countries in Africa, but also to uh, deliver impact and, and deliver true solutions in the communities where um, the project is operating. I am now pleased to welcome the representative of Fundazione Compañía San Paolo. Fundazione Compañía de San Paolo was established for philanthropic purposes to promote cultural, social, and economic development, building on the strength of its assets and heritage. The foundation works on initiatives focused on three main pillars, culture, people, and planet, each of them linked to the achievement of 14 different outcomes. Please join me as we welcome to the floor Francesco Profumo, president of Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo. In addition to leading Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo, Francesco is professor of electrical machines at the Politecnico di Torino and former dean of engineering. Before heading the foundation, Francesco was president of the National Research Council, Minister of Education, University, and chaired several research and academic organizations. He also chaired uh, um, several research councils uh, in Italy and is member of the European Innovation Council Board. Francesco, it is a true honor to welcome you today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Morales, for the introduction. 
And thank you, Vice President Sorlini, for the project overview. And many thanks to all of you for attending this first COPEN Summit. It's my great honor and pleasure to open this important international meeting on behalf of Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation. I would like to highlight two interesting points to share with those present. First, Africa is the continent of tomorrow. With the solid economic development, a young population set to double by 2050, a fast-growing innovation ecosystem and a huge natural resources, Africa will be the land of future opportunities. Thanks to the Africa Initiative promoted by the European Commission, our vision and approach are thankfully evolving. As a strategic partner, the EU has to enhance cooperation with Africa to promote actions targeted to finding locally adapted solutions to challenges that are global in nature, but which often hit Africa head -earth. This is also a good framework for our intervention. We strongly believe in the power of innovation and we are very proud to have supported the implementation of more than 20 projects across many African countries to try to solve these challenges. But the waiver innovation does not work if it is an end in itself. Innovation can only express its transformative potential if it is made available to others, public institutions, non-profit organizations, international development banks and agencies, impact investors. That's exactly what we want to do today. This first Copen Summit is not the completion of the project. On the contrary, it's a starting point for us. So, let me express my appreciation for those who believed in this dissemination initiative. Uh, IFAD, World Food Fro Program, Food and Agriculture Organization, United Nations, many thanks for your participation. The second thought is related to our role as a foundation. As you know, the final goal of COPEN is to contribute in some way to achieve the UN Agenda 2030. In my opinion, this is a very significant approach because the foundations of bank of origin, like Compagnia di San Paolo and the Fondazione Cariplo, are leaving a huge transition from a local grant maker model to impact the developers at an international level. Faced with the such a rapidly changing framework, philanthropic organizations have launched the new forms of collaboration and partnership. Additionally, they have equipped themselves with the strategic and operational models that reflect an innovation and the original approach to philanthropic as an actor capable of experiencing measurable impact. The Innovation for Development Project, and more specifically COPEN, represents a good experiment that is consistent with this strategy, both because of the joint involvement of Italy's to lending foundation of banking origin and because of a renewed commitment in the field of international development cooperation. Innovation for development should be seen as a key part of an approach that aims at harnesses the value of methodological, technological and digital innovation. By deploying a wide range of tools, initiatives and interventions, 
modern philanthropy is complementing its traditional grant making role with a new role as an impact facilitator and developer, driving long term economic growth and development. We are strongly committed to this path and we will do more in the future. So, good luck to our civil society organizations, startup and teams of, of innovators for their pitch and presentation. And thank you for your attention. I look forward to a fruitful and constructive discussion. Thank you so much, Francesco. Um, I would just like to highlight some of the points that you made during your speech, the way that um, your foundation is focusing on delivering truly transformational results for the communities where you're working and uh, the, spe the specialized focus that you have on research and the development, the, the, the delivery of evidence so that decisions can be can be made in on a basis of data uh, and evidence. Thank you so much for that. I am now pleased to inter introduce uh, Cariplo Factory Benefit Company, which is the Open Innovation Hub of Fondazione Cariplo. It activates a talent chain that includes open innovation projects and the internationalization of support activities with a commitment to create a positive impact in the communities where it operates. I am thrilled to welcome Carlo Mango, Managing Director of Cariplo Factory, where he has been the CEO since 2016 and has led the scientific research and technology transfer area since 2000. Before joining Cariplo Factory, Carlos served as member of the Supervisory Advisory Board of the European Investment Bank and is currently advisor of the European Commission. Carlo is also a member of several international scientific committees and think tanks focused on food, life sciences, bioeconomy, tech transfer and the circular economy. Carlo, over to you. Thank you very much, Gladys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are very pr proud as Cariplo Factory to see a day of meeting, discussion and inspiration materialize, which is the result of a, an important synergic action uh, launched in recent years, thanks to the close collaboration with foundations, uh, Fondazione Cariplo and Compagnia San Paolo, and all the partners of the initiatives which we, which we thank. I would also like to thank uh, the international speakers pr present here today from uh, IFID, La Macarto Foundation, the, the World Food Program, and the IFAO. Last but not least, I thank, thank very much the civil society organization and the, innovation, and the innovators who are protagonists, not only in the co-open project, but also in the changes that we have implemented in these recent years. We like to imagine Co-Open Summit, Summit as a bridge, a junction between Africa and Italy to be inspired by innovative, generative and high impact projects. 11 partnerships generated by the skills and experiences of civil society organizations and innovators, start, mainly startups, university, are here today on this virtual stage to share their journey undertaking following, following the call for, uh, for innovation, circular economy initiatives, and the call food and sustainable agriculture, for which we received about 20, uh, 250 applications from Italian and African innovators. It was a great honor uh, for us to support the birth and uh, the development of these two participatory paths of the Co-Open Initiative, which aims to create impactful solutions in Africa through training and exchange of skills, the enhancement of agricultural productivity, the improvement of crops biodiversity, the management and transformation of waste, the incentive to reuse and recycling up to the dissemination of the culture of reuse and change of behavior. As Cariplo Factory, we have supported the applications of innovators, guiding them from the submission of the business proposal to their selection and creation of partnerships with civil society organization. 
in the implementation of the test phase dedicated to supporting courses created by Italian and African incubators and accelerators selected on specific needs of each project. And coming out, uh, our network of partners built up over the years uh, and who might take the, this opportunity to, to thank. Up to the implementation in a second phase of the so-called execute phase dedicated to grounding the pilot projects in Africa so that I, that it can have the, the desired impact within the reference community. In conclusion, I thank again the civil society organization and the innovators who with Coopen have decided to get involved to develop projects capable of innovate, improving people's lives, protecting the environment, and building a future and sustainable and successful development by managing the present and at the same time drawing solid development plans. It only remains for me to wish you to let yourself be, be inspired by this event at Twist Par in order to build increasing solid bridges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlo. Um, I, I really liked uh, your uh, your statements about the combination of innovation and uh, technology transfer and how the two can uh, be developed and designed in uh, unison with the end user to ensure the adoption, sustainability, but also accessibility. Thank you so much, Carlo, for those very inspiring words. I am now pleased to introduce a video from UNDP by Urika Moder. Uh, she is UNDP's Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau of External Relations and Advocacy on Circular Economy and Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems. This is within the context of innovation for sustainable development in Africa. Enjoy the video part of the Cooper Summit and the conversations on the power of innovation in Africa to address current development challenges. Because harnessing the knowledge of local innovators across the continent to close the gap towards the Sustainable Development Goals has been a priority for the UN Development Programme for years. Our Accelerator Labs network is the world's largest and fastest learning network on sustainable development challenges. With 91 labs covering 115 countries, 35 of which are located in Africa, we are tapping into grassroots innovations that move us towards a more sustainable future. Because when we talk of innovation, what we are actually talking about is finding new ways of doing development and the powerful opportunity that this can bring. At UNDP, we have seen firsthand how fusing local knowledge with innovation can help to reimagine the future of development in Africa. For example, in Burkina Faso, we are integrating sustainable land management with social cohesion. And in Mozambique, we are working hand in hand with communities to identify innovative ways to protect farms for wildlife while generating revenue. It's only by making innovation in Africa a priority that we can unlock the continent's creative and economic potential, enhance human development and put us on the right track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Because while it is clear that there is a global momentum for this important work, there are also significant challenges. Rising food and energy prices fueled by the war in Ukraine are really threatening the security and well-being of people across the continent, many of whom are struggling to recover from the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, high prices of fertilizers and disruptions to global markets are destabilizing Africa's food systems. With Africa importing 80% of the fertilizers it consumes, communities face a catch-22 situation. Rising prices are pushing imported food beyond the reach of so many, while the sky-high price of fertilizer limits the supply of homegrown foods. Of course, inevitably, this is leading to an in increase in hunger and poverty. But opportunities, they do exist. For instance, Africa has significantly more production capacity for fertilizer than it is currently utilizing. This could really reduce the continent's reliance on global markets and their volatile prices. A focus on innovation in the production of food, fertilizer and energy, and in diversifying as well exports away from primary commodities towards higher value added products 
could also have a transformational impact on African communities and countries. But this will, of course, require an enabling environment where resources and investments are injected into communities and partnerships are nurtured to bring in these new perspectives. Because in many ways, the current pace of science, technology and innovation in Africa is behind other regions. In recent years, less than 2,000 applications for patents were made by residents on the continent, compared to over 1.5 billion annually in East Asia and the Pacific. And Africa currently dedicates less than 0.5% of its GDP to investments in research and development, compared to 2.6% in East Asia and the Pacific, and 1.5% in North Africa and the Middle East. Financing must also be considered, and we must focus on new sources of finance beyond the traditional channels. Innovative finance for Africa will mean embracing climate finance or innovative green finance. Diaspora bonds and more creative use of fiscal and monetary policy could also be explored as opportunities. Developing a healthy local digital economy is of course also a really powerful tool to transform local businesses. Through the Accelerator Labs in Uganda, UNDP is supporting an online market intelligence platform that facilitates export trade, business-to-business -business exchanges and connections between Uganda, MSMEs and counterparts in other countries. And in Rwanda, we are looking closely with the government and the Edison Alliance to support its move towards a cashless economy supported by mobile payments. In closing, Partners and policymakers must recognize the value of innovation and invest accordingly. Because building Africa's innovation capacity is not only vital for the world we live in today, it's also fundamental to Africa's future development. And let us not forget that the agents for change who are at the forefront of driving the innovation for development agenda are not only the major companies or research institutions, they are also citizens and local actors. UNDP is delighted to be part of the Coopen Summit and we really look forward to deepen our partnership with Italy across government, civil society and academia and also the private sector. I wish everyone a very fruitful exchange of ideas throughout the summit. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to uh, UNDP for uh, the video and for joining the Coopen Summit today. Um, and also for uh, their uh, encouraging words about the enhancement of this partnership. We heard from Claudia, we heard from Francesco, from Ursula, from Carlo. And uh, one message that is consistent in all of the speeches that we have heard today is that it is not about innovation just for the sake of innovation. The, we need to work towards innovation that delivers truly impact and technologies that are designed with the user to ensure accessibility and to ensure also adoption. Ownership is a key word that we keep listening to and also how our agencies, how our ecosystem is, face, is facing challenges that are unprecedented. So we also need unprecedented solutions to face those challenges. I would like now to move on to our innovation flow, but before opening the floor to our speakers, let me please share some information about the Coupon project. Coupen is a participatory path promoted by Innovazione per lo Sviluppo, and it was designed in several phases. The first call for interest was issued in July 2020, and this was followed by a call for innovators to find solutions in three different areas. Circular economy, food and sustainable agriculture, and good health and well-being. The incubation and acceleration phases already took place, and teams are now being supported with mentoring and capacity sharing initiatives. I am now pleased to introduce you to today's keynote speakers. Please join me to welcome Caroline Legro, Deputy Director of the Innovation and Knowledge Management Division at the World Food Program. Caroline brings nearly 20 years of working experience throughout the UN system, including as Deputy Director of the World Food Program uh, Office in, China, in the China Center of Excellence for South to South Cooperation, Head of, Head, Head of Corporate Partnerships at UNHCR, and numerous operational roles with uh, WFP in India, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Iraq, and Jordan. Caroline, over to you. Thank you so much, Gladys, and thanks so much to the Coupon organizers for inviting me to this event. 
it gives me so much energy to to be at these events where we really talk about innovation in great detail with the private sector, with innovators, and with different members of the UN family. So it's a real honor and privilege for me to speak with you today. Um, the topic of my conversation is about really the global food crisis and why we need innovation now more than ever. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just start with some statistics. This is the state of our world today. Chronic hunger is very high. 828 million people go to bed uh, hungry each night. Acute hunger, 349 million people. These are people who are knocking on famine's door. More than 700 million people living in extreme poverty. That's less than $1.25 a day. And displacement. The number of people who've had to force, who, who were forced to flee their homes because of conflict, climate change, um, more than 100 million people. And a, a huge proportion of the world's population living without healthy diets, without the adequate nutrients that they need to lead a healthy life. And on the other hand, we have never been richer. Global wealth um, across the world is at $464 trillion. So in a world of plenty, you know, hunger should really be a thing of the past, but it's not. Um, and I think that that's why it's so important to come together and have conversations like this today at the Coupon Summit, because the reality that exists today is something that should not be. If we go to the next slide, um, I will talk through just four topics today, an overview of the World Food Program, of the global food crisis, what's happening right now. Really, business as usual is not enough, why innovation is so important. And then I'll just give you a few examples for inspiration um, that can hopefully give you some food for thought for the rest of the day. So let's just start with WFP. Um, next slide, please. Keep going. So when you think of food delivery, do you think of ordering on your phone on Deliveroo or Just Eat or Glovo? Well, what we do is slightly different. Next slide, please. WFP, the World Food Program, uh, is the United Nations agency that is focused on food security and fighting hunger. We are the world's largest humanitarian agency with a focus on saving lives and changing lives across the world. Um, we were honored and humbled to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize um, two years ago because we really believe that food is the pathway to peace. If you do not have enough food in your belly, then it's very hard to have peace. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, WFP is the world's largest humanitarian agency. Uh, we have a current budget of about $12 billion. More than 21,000 staff spread across over 120 countries. And every day, WFP operates more than 100 aircraft, 30 ships, and over 5,000 trucks. Next slide, please. And the focus of WFP really is on two sustainable development goals. The first is a world with zero hunger. So really that first slide that I showed you, we should be at zero hunger by 2030. That's the goal of sustainable development goal number two, that we should end all forms of hunger and malnutrition by 2030 and make sure that all people, especially children, have enough nutritious food all year round. Um, and to achieve this goal really is not the job of one agency or one country. It really, really requires partnerships. So the other SDG that the World Food Program really focuses on is 
partnerships for the goals. And that's why I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation with you today, because a world of zero hunger really needs the private sector, it needs academia, it needs UN agencies, governments, um, as well as those young people on the ground to really make a difference. So let me move on now to the current situation with the global food crisis. As I said, right now, there are over 800 million people in this world who do not have enough food to eat. That's one in 10 people. And that number is going up, unfortunately. So we saw that in 1990, there were 1 billion undernourished people in this world. And, um, and progress uh, took place that number came down by nearly half to 589 million people in 2015. But in recent years, that number, uh, the number of people who do not have enough food to eat has gone back up. Um, and the reason for that is, if you go to the next slide, really there are big drivers of that. We all know about COVID-19 climate change, conflict, inflation. These are all reasons that the number of hungry people has gone up. Um, we are facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. So the number of people facing acute food insecurity that's really on the brink of starvation has nearly doubled from 2019 to 2022. If you go into the next slide, um, you see that really that these are the major drivers of hunger. Conflict is the biggest driver. You have 60% of the world's hungry living in areas affected by war and violence. Climate is another issue. Climate shocks, the extreme weather is destroying crops, livelihoods, um, making people have to leave their homes. And that situation, as we know, is, is getting worse. Of course, I don't have to talk about COVID-19. We've all experienced it. That has been a major driver of hunger in the last few years. Um, and as we're all feeling now, when we go to the grocery store, costs are really at an all-time high. Next slide, please. And um, even before the war in Ukraine started, food prices were at an all-time all high. Um, now, um, this slide shows you a little bit about how concentrated the world's food supplies are. So you see that seven countries make up 86% of global wheat exports. Five countries make up 78% of global coarse grains. Four countries, only four countries make up 85% of global corn exports. Five countries make up 78% of rice exports. And only two countries make up 87% of global soybean exports. There's a very concentrated market for these very important crops that we all rely on. Before the conflict began in Russia and Ukraine, um, Russia and Ukraine were huge food exporters. So Russia and Ukraine together provided 30% of global wheat exports, 20% of maize, 73% of global sunflower exports, and 12% of crude oil. So you can see that Russia and Ukraine were really a breadbasket for the rest of the world, for North Africa, for, um, for many countries around the world. They are huge suppliers of food commodities. Um, so, you know, you can look at this slide and think, gosh, we're really in trouble. Or you can look at this slide and think, within challenge lies opportunity. We have our private sector partners on the call. 
We have, um, you know, entrepreneurs who are thinking um, towards the future. I think we had the intervention from UNDP saying invest in innovation in Africa. I will go one step further and say invest in agricultural innovation in Africa with imports being more expensive. The way forward is to invest in local production, local value chain improvements. Um, and I think that here is an opportunity to really develop um, innovative ways of farming and innovative, innovative ways of growing the food on the land. Um, so my next message to you is really, business as usual is not enough. Next slide, please. Um, we see that the current system of having huge amounts of food supplies controlled by a small number of countries is not a good way to go. Where we need to go is towards sustainable agriculture um, in Africa, in different parts of the world. And one way really is to invest in innovative ways of doing that. That's something that WFP has done. Um, we have the WFP Innovation Accelerator that was uh, founded in 2015. Um, and it really aims to source, support, and scale high impact innovations to disrupt hunger. Next slide, please. And similar to the innovation path that you have described for the Coupon Summit, um, WFP has a similar process where we offer challenges. Um, so far, we've had over 8,000, nearly 9,000 now applications for our innovation challenge. We have regular boot camps, five days to really go into these innovations. And the good ones are selected for our sprint program where they get some seed funding and some mentoring support to really move the idea in towards impact. And we're now at the stage where we're looking at a number of really excellent initiatives on how we can scale them up further across WFP and, and beyond. Um, so far we've had innovations implemented in 67 countries. And as of last year, we've reached over 9 million people. And I, this last part of my presentation is just to give you, uh, next slide, a few uh, examples of innovations that the World Food Program has supported across the world in the area of resilience and agriculture. And to give you some inspiration, uh, we've got some great people attending this summit. And I think, you know, here are some uh, ideas for inspiration. We're going to hear a lot more uh, in the rest of the summit. So I'll just very quickly go through these. Um, this Kusa One is really about creating youth led frontline extension networks. It's, um, I think, for a lot of youth uh, in different parts of Africa, farming is not. Um, Agriculture is not an interesting area of work. They see their parents and grandparents with a hoe working hard and not making money. And we have to change that. And this project is one that has shifted that to let's bring the best tools to farming. Let's bring digital insights, um, market prices, weather information, farming techniques, um, to the tablets of our farmers on the ground. Um, and this has been a youth-led initiative, the extension workers going around and supporting farmers um, with this digital outreach. Next is uh, a great initiative in Cambodia, which is about um, alternative protein, you, the development of cricket-based, insect-based snacks, I think that there is going to be a growing demand for insect-based protein across the world. It's much cheaper and more environmentally friendly to produce than meat. 
um, and it's also much healthier. So this is the production of cricket-based snacks. The next one is about using technology to bring about land tenure rights. So this is a, this is an initiative in Ghana. Um, if you don't have that piece of paper saying you own the land, it's very difficult to make improvements, to make investments, to, to um, you know, think about the sustainability of your land. So this initiative was working with the government and using digital technology to map out the areas of land and ensure that the people who owned that land had that certificate to show that this land is mine. And next, lastly, this is, um, I love this project. This is a project um, that's very much in line with the, the growing shared economy that we have these days. Um, these days, you know, you order your Uber, your taxi online, you borrow a bicycle, you, you rent a bicycle or an e-scooter. This is about um, using uh, uh, agricultural uh, technology that's really cheap, small equipment for processing, for threshing wheat. Um, this can go on the back of a motorbike and it can be rented for a day or a few days for that part of the, the agricultural season um, when it's needed. And this really brings about, you know, moving from the hoe to using cheap, affordable technology uh, that can help with the production um, and help with the processing in a very affordable way. Um, and, and the last one is really, it's something that came out from our, our founders of the Innovation Accelerator. It's called Share the Meal. Sometimes people feel, when they hear the statistics that I gave you at the beginning of this presentation, people sometimes feel overwhelmed. It's too much. How are we ever going to end global hunger? And the answer is one meal at a time for, for a lot of people, um, this is a this is something that you can. It's a mobile app. For eighty cents, you can provide a meal to someone in need, um, and this can, app can be found on Google Play, on the iPhone Store, um, and and people can donate to WFP the cost of a meal or the cost of a hundred meals, and it's it's been really effective. We've shared over 164 me million meals already. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you today. And my last slide is really, um, is really for you, the innovators uh, attending this summit. There's a huge crisis, our global food crisis. There is a huge number of people who do not have enough food to eat but never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That's Margaret Mead. Um, thanks very much. Caroline, thank you so much for that very truly in insightful presentation. I have to agree with you when you presented those numbers and uh, even for people that see those numbers on a daily basis like us, it is daunting. It, it gives you a really daunting feeling. Uh, uh, it's overwhelming. And, and sometimes you ask yourselves, will, will the international community really be able to contribute to make a, a sustainable change and, uh, and make things different for everybody? So for for you know, to address that feeling, um, I really welcome the cooperation, the ongoing cooperation that we have to, with the World Food, Program, uh, World Food Program and with the WFP Innovation Accelerator in Munich. We work with uh, Hila Cohen on a continuing basis. And uh, one of the things that I really like about the, the partnership that we have is uh, how we seek transparency and how we say it doesn't matter who does it. The important thing is that we achieve the sustainable development goals. So we're working towards uh, towards those goals. A um, couple of things you established uh, very well and very clearly. 
the link between climate change, conflict, migration, and how that affects uh, hunger. I think that uh, we need to think very, very carefully about um, how we address these issues, about how we uh, develop solutions that uh, are, are truly sustainable and that are addressing some of the problems that sometimes are cultural, sometimes are economic, um, as, as the one that you mentioned with agriculture, the fact that agriculture, agriculture is not attractive for for youth and we need to make it sexier. We need and, and some ways of making it sexier is through digital agriculture, but you know, whatever we do, it has to ensure rural prosperity. It has to ensure impact. During COVID-19, um, if had responded very quickly with a rural poor um, stimulus facility, and we have been collaborating with WFP in regional offices, not only with the Innovation Accelerator, but also our regional offices are continuously collaborating with uh, WFP to achieve uh, our different objectives. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline, again. I would like now to move on to the introduction of our um, first, uh, the first round of projects that we'll be looking at today. So the first one is digitizing livestock value chain, food safety, and open up markets, um, Manitesi. This is a non-governmental organization that has been working to achieve social, economic, and, and environmental justice around the world for over 50 years. Gini Plus Global Limited is an organization that offers modern and advanced agricultural solutions to enhance on-farm best practices and support, and support sustainable agricultural production. This project was developed by this partnership and it aimed at creating a locally led and developed solution for livestock traceability. The farmer's main benefit is an increased capability to monitor the animal's health conditions and detecting problems in a timely manner. Over to you. Thank you so much, Gladys. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gladys, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Fondazione Care per Compagnia di San Paolo. My name is uh, Samuele Tini, and together with me, there is the CEO and founder of uh, uh, Gine Plus Global, uh, Chris Silali. All started with a question. Is it safe, uh, the food we eat? And then we started asking, hmm, not really. And so we started de developing this project. So that the key word to uh, summarize it is traceability. We want to ensure healthy production practices, food safety, and also support farmers, as, as Gladys rightly say, in monitor their animal, but also making their animal possible to transform them in asset. And Chris will discuss about that. First of all, who we are? We are a partnership of an NGO, Manitese, coming from Italy, uh, which has focused a lot of innovation in the spirit of this uh, program, the Co-Open program, and even other programs. And we work a lot on entrepreneurship and at the nexus of conservation and entrepreneurship, enabling community to really be protagonists and really actors of change. And together with us, we found along the way an innovator who is at the forefront here in Kenya of the biotechnology innovation and the digital technology, and Gene Plus, who has a long and extensive experience, and I'm sure you will see how far we have gone in this in this partnership. But again, where? We had to start at somewhere, and of course, to to to, to reach the minimal viable pro product and uh, the proof of concept that was discussed in the introduction, we had to start to one point, and we decided to start where in Kenya, where we are present, and of course in a particular area, the area of Nakuru County. Why? Because traditionally in the Rift Valley in this area has been in Kenya the, the strongest present and the highest agricultural area in the country. And then you might say, but then what do you, what do you try to solve? And then we try to solve and we try to discuss it within us. How is it safe? The question that I ask. And we have seen Kenya generally is growing. It's a country now in the middle income and is going with the vision 2030 even higher. Then 46% of the population, as you can see, will become urban. Meat consumption will be very big and will growing almost 4% per year. But then safety is not yet there. There is little confidence 
And if you read the newspapers in Kenya, we have been marred with scandals. The cat and egg sam dog samosas that we put there of substandard meat in supermarket. So with Chris, we decided how we can ensure traceability, how we can reinforce confidence in consumers. And while going there and with our extensive work with small scale farmer, we have seen that they have the need really to, to ensure their traceability because the way the market is organized now is like a, there is a lot of lack of transparency and a lot of value. Instead of going back to the farmer, there are hard working farmers go back to intermediaries and brokers. So how we have done this, how we have developed this challenge and to do this, I think Chris, our daughter Chris, can discuss the solution. Over to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samuel, and uh, with a good introduction. As you've been told, my name is uh, Chris Silani. I am the CEO of G Plus and founder. On this uh, solution, uh, we think that we needed to find a solution that would uh, both provide um, uh, farmers with uh, an incentive to be able to monitor the animal's health, be able to also trace activities on the farm, but also at the same time be able to assure the consumers of the meat or the, the meat products they're consuming, whether they buy in, in, in butchers or supermarkets or whichever other product channels they get from. Uh, this as well has been uh, a major issue in Kenya. It's not able to export anything uh, on from farmers, uh, mainly in the light of segment, milk and meat, because of lack of traceability. And in this our solution uh, anchors around being able to provide information through a smart tagging technology, where we're able to provide uh, uh, farmers with a, a tag that will identify the animals uniquely, provide information on location, ownership, movement, and health. All this information is captured in real time and stored in a blockchain uh, back-end store, storehouse. And this information is thereby used as a traceability module where consumers or partakers of these products of the chain can refer to. This application also helps farmers on a day-to-day -day management of their farm animals, as well as managing health protocols on the farm. We are sure that through this and through a tagging, uh, uh, tapping into information from the back end, we are able to generate QR codes that will be an assurance on products in the supermarket end for consumers as we go forth, and thereby also open up uh, Kenyan produce to the world and open the Kenyan export potential. The innovation itself, and this is the tag, and this is a product tag that we developed from scratch, and the tag is solar powered. It has a much network um, uh, opportunity to, to tap into both uh, um, mobile phones uh, through um, modules that are either RFID or through um, IoT technologies that we're able to, to, to be able to communicate this information from the child towards receptors or recipient um, modules um, to the child, from the child to the computers to the storehouse. We track, we are able to track a uh, movement of the animal, the activities of the animal, uh, body temperatures that will be aligned to the health systems of the animal. The ambient temperature as well, together with movement, would be able to call farmers know why animals are producing at a certain level. As I talked about it, it's also blockchain. Next, please. Through this, we were able to develop about 10 prototypes that were tested in farms. And these prototypes were able to churn the information that we saw uh, designed to, for it to, 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 to churn. And the, the information was disseminated to farmers through uh, trainings, as well as uh, discussion groups. And through this, we were able to, to create a whole entire system from prototypes to a software that could uh, get this information digested in smaller, better information that will be uh, received and understood by farmers. 
and the same information while at sharing with different people it received a lot of good and um, exception and desire for the project to have a second and fourth phase or a third phase for scale up next please we anticipate that we are able to replicate this uh, 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 ability module in different places and this one we were thinking about trying on different types of animals as well as trying to see if we can be able to partner with other uh, uh, um, organizations, entities to unlock finance, for example, for farmers. Because one thing that we've also realized along the financial value chain is that many banks are, are not willing to finance farmers, especially on movable assets like, like uh, livestock, but we're not well dressed. And within this one model that will open up that, but also extensively develop into other counties in the region and also led of takers of the animals for value like abattoirs and other service providers that banks and insurance. Next, please. We anticipate that in the second phase, we're able to expand into other value chains and build a local manufacturing capacity for this type of prototype to be able to provide this solution to a wider group of people. And local manufacturing would also mean that the uh, the, 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 the the solution will be cheaper and locally available to many farmers and also be able to open up opportunity for other uh, partners to participate in the chain, support our farmers to produce better and be able to uh, open up our farmers into commercial agriculture. I think that should be the last slide. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, people have lots of questions, uh, follow-up questions for you, especially since the project makes uh, use of blockchain technologies and we all know uh, the challenges that sometimes you have, um, not only in Africa, but also in other regions to implement uh, projects with frontier technology. So uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions. So moving on, we uh, are going to now listen to the traceability and product quality system for fresh products in the Ethiopian agri-value chain. LVA, this is an Italian association which deals with international solidarity and cooperation. It is committed to foster ways to generate local and global change to overcome extreme poverty, reinforce equitable and sustainable development, and enhance the dialogue between Italian and African communities. Apio SRL is an innovative startup that offers services related to renewable energy management. Together, they have designed a project that certifies and secures the products along the agricultural supply chain in Ethiopia. The project works to improve the quality of fresh products, food safety, and income generation for Ethiopians. The project raised awareness about the importance of reducing environmental pollution and using sustainable agricultural practices. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gladys, for the introduction. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Giulio Montalbano, LVA Ethiopia country representative. Uh, we are here today to introduce you a joint pilot project that we decide to call uh, Traceability and Products Quality System for Fresh Products in Ethiopian Agri-Value Chain together with the uh, implemented by LVA, indeed, with the innovative uh, Italian SME Apio. LVA stands for Lay Volunteers uh, International Association, is uh, an international NGO active in Ethiopia and among other regions in the Oromia regional state to create uh, decent jobs and business opportunities in the agri-food sector. Uh, Apio uh, is an innovative SME that develops uh, trust up to drive transparency in the agri-food sector through democratic uh, approach using blockchain and open source techno technology. The project aimed uh, basically to serve a number of uh, target beneficiaries identified through LVA's decades of experience in the country, uh, activating stakeholders and other communities already involved and trying to make economies uh, of scale and synergies with the intervention mechanism that 
we developed uh, in uh, several paths uh, already activated uh, in the country. So the beneficiaries of the project uh, mainly includes uh, one uh, cooperative union uh, named the Mekibatu Fruit and Vegetable Primary Cooperative Union, composed of uh, 153 primary cooperative members uh, with 8,085 farmer members. We select uh, among these farmers, we select 65 farmers coming from five primary cooperatives according to the crops seasonality and then 14 commodities identified. The farmers were based in three districts called Woredas in Ethiopia, uh, areas of production that well, uh, they, they, they were very well known for their potentiality in the, in the agribusiness value chain, mainly fruit and, and vegetables. The identified customer in this pilot project was the Ethiopian Airlines, the biggest airline company in Africa, in their main hub of Addis Abeba. As I already said, the, the uh, target country uh, of, the, of this project was uh, Ethiopia, the second biggest country in Africa, one of Africa's fastest growing economies. The agro-industrial sector um, in this country is considered by the government and all other development actors um, with uh, uh, over 85% of the population living and working in rural areas. So the Ethiopian government has based its, all its economic policies on the agriculture sector, adopting uh, uh, an agricultural development-led industrialization strategy that is intended to initiate the industrialization process through the development and modernization of, of the agriculture sector. LVA and uh, APIO uh, decide to undertake uh, this process in recognizing some uh, problems and challenges encountered in the field and in dialogue with all stakeholders involved and the communities. Some examples at first level in the agri uh, value chain, our farmers, uh, we realize they have a very low bargaining power in their respective market. The cooperative unions that aggregate these farmers face several operational difficulties, especially about the incorporation of uh, innovation and technologies that uh, may help their productivities. And finally, the business customers and final users in Ethiopia don't receive any information about the product. This, all of this implies uh, at the end the impossibility of sharing information with the various actors of the uh, agri-food supply chain. In few words, the main challenge was an asymmetric information gap which affect uh, food security because there are several problems related to the product traceability and product recalling. Uh, also the quality of, of product uh, about the difficulty improving product provenance and shelf life and the uh, income generation because this uh, low knowledge and skills on traceability of unions and cooperatives like reduce the value and the price of the products. So um, now, um, after this introduction of the project, uh, it is my pleasure to leave the floor to my colleague Alessandro Kelly from CEO and founder of Apio, that will explain better the implementation of uh, the technology in the agriculture value chain. Thank you. Thank you, Giulio. Thank you, everybody, for uh, this opportunity. Uh, as uh, Giulio said, uh, as Apio, we have developed uh, a track and trace platform uh, called uh, uh, Trusty. Uh, Trusty is uh, a platform for uh, data sharing in the supply chain. During the project, we have set up the backbone for data sharing in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of supply chain. And in particular, we develop uh, tools that are able to collect data offline uh, with no mobility connective uh, that can be used in several parts of the supply chain. So starting from the farmer to the cooperative and then to the uh, processor and then can be used by the, the customer through, uh, block, uh, through a QR code. Uh, every actor at the supply chain can share information with other actors and uh, are secure that the information shared are timestamped 
and uh, maintain data ownership through uh, identity. Uh, we don't cover only the uh, tech aspect because thanks to 3LVA, we have the opportunity to arrange training on field with farmers, uh, uh, cooperative, uh, the Makibatu Union, the customers and the, all the stakeholders of the project. And also we have the opportunity to uh, talk with the customers, uh, uh, the Ethiopian airline, in particular uh, the Bol Airport, uh, to uh, understand uh, how to use the, to uh, teach how to use the platform, how to see the traceability event, how to see, uh, to use the platform to improve uh, the food security and the food observability of the supply chain. Uh, there are several uh, innovative elements inside the, the project. Uh, uh, offshore, of course, uh, the blockchain, uh, the public blockchain used for uh, data validation that uh, enable everybody to uh, check the timestamp and the identity of who share uh, the platform. In particular, when we have several actors, this is a very important aspect for farmers that are secured and for the customer that assure that. Uh, the information are secure and time stamped. But another important aspect is the use of open source technology for data collection, because this kind of uh, aspect uh, improve the scalability of the project in the future, because uh, we uh, teach how to use the uh, platform, but the platform can be used as a stack open source by everybody and by other cooperatives in the future. Uh, what we uh, impact is very important because we start with ze uh, zero information about traceability and after the project we have uh, 14, over 14 commodities tracked, over 100 batch tracked, uh, digitally tracked with uh, timestamp and proof of identity. We have over 600 uh, events registered in public blockchain. So we uh, see that the platform is easy to um, and fast to adopt, that the uh, fact that works offline is very interesting in emerging country. Um, and we see that the customer appreciate the uh, platform and want to scale to other, uh, other cafeteria and other airports. So I leave the floor to Giulio to the scalability and repl uh, replicability aspect of the project. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, so just to give a very brief insight about the uh, sustainability, how it was drafted by in the project and the replicability of the project. Uh, after the end of the project, last July, Mekibatu Cooperative Unions continued to use the platform, registering over 115 production batches. 150,000 kg of uh, fresh products have been tracked. And now uh, we are we are still following up these uh, activities and they are using the platform without any constraints and without any any difficulty. So for the future, LVA and Apio, uh, along with the stakeholders involved, uh, tried to envisage some further steps, such as uh, evaluation of the involvement of the farmers in data collection, uh, especially for cooperatives with, with the cluster co crops cultivation. Uh, we are trying to extend the traceability to other farmers of the union and other unions to extend the, the width of, uh, of the project. Uh, finally, the exploitation of collect data can be used for different purposes related to certification, especially for export, market linkage agreement, and the access to microcredit and finance. Um, just to close, extension of blockchain related services can be for sure beyond Ethiopian Airlines, be connected to other hotels, restaurants, uh, universities, schools, hospitals, and all other business entities that could be interested to the uh, technology. So we hope that some of these ideas could be realized through other wider intervention, the opportunities, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julio and Alessandro, for the presentation. I have to say that there, there were several factors within your presentation that caught my attention. Uh, the use of open source technology and uh, the fact that you are already tracing over 14 commodities, uh, it's, uh, that's quite impressive. But more interesting, I think, is, is the process that you have followed in order to implement this, uh, this initiative. That, that is something that I would like to explore further, uh, hopefully during the networking sessions that uh, will follow the, the next presentation. 
Um, I really liked the, the approach and uh, very much aligned to also EFAT's vision of how innovations should uh, be supported, which is not only to provide access to financing, which is super important as you, as your project uh, mentioned uh, during the presentation, but also uh, by the team that uh, was before you. Uh, financing, however, can cannot have as much impact if you're not accompanying that financing with mentoring and capacity sharing. Capacity sharing, because we also believe, like you do, like you expressed during your presentation, that um, learning happens both ways. So it's, it's not that we are delivering this uh, capacity building, as we used to call it before, but it's, it's, it's truly a, a sharing of, of capacity, a sharing of uh, learning knowledge and uh, the the adaptation testing the piloting of these ideas happens both ways so so we can all all learn from each other so um i would like to now move on to our next project and please keep in mind uh, the audience that uh, everybody that is joining us today keep in mind these different projects because we're going to break you up in uh, in rooms later on in the day after the the following presentation so make sure that you are keeping track of the names of the projects that you are interested in so that you can go into those rooms and explore further these initiatives. So the next project is Senegal Circular. It is also by Elvia and Mercato Circolare SRL, which is an innovative startup that creates digital and cultural connections among citizens, companies, associations, and institutions within the circular economy ecosystem. This project aims to promote and disseminate the principles of the circular economy in Senegal, as well as giving visibility and networking opportunities to local enterprises, from the smallest to the largest. I would like now to give the floor to, uh, the, to the team of Senegal Circular. Over to you guys. Good morning. I'm the project coordinator of LVA in Senegal. And I'm here today with Nadia Lambiase from Mercato Circolare. She's co-founder and CEO of the startup. Uh, together, we, we developed the project Senegal Circular, which we are presenting you today. Uh, LVI is an international and solidarity cooperation association uh, uh, born in Italy in 1966. And we are in Senegal from 1963 in, uh, in the town of Thiès. We fight against uh, poverty, we work in, on sustainable, sustainable development, and we promote the dialogue between Italian and African communities. Our partner, Mercato Circolare, is an, is an innovative startup born in two, 2018. Uh, they have a social vocation, they create uh, digital and cultural connections between citizens, companies, and institutions as well as they create tools in the innovative tools in the domain of circular economy. Um, we decided to work in Senegal on the, in, uh, in the field of circular economy because the, it, this uh, concept is uh, more and more important uh, in Senegal and even at governmental level it, it has been launched a significant project but uh, there's a lack of, uh, of dissemination among the citizens and a lack of subject enablers in, uh, in the country. So it was necessary to promote the interaction between the different actors of circular economy to make a dissemination among the, the, the population and to, to promote the adoption of circular business models. Um, this is why we adopted a challenge that is, that is to identify and connect the, the realities of circular economy in Dakar and Thiès uh, at the beginning, but we want to extend it to all of the country. And, and to do that through the use of the app Mercato Circolare. So I will let Nadia explain you more in detail this solution. Thank you, Helena. Uh, thank you, everybody. So to meet this challenge, uh, we came up with this uh, three-part solution involving local sentinels for mapping activities, training activities for the local sentinels, and implementation of the Mercato Circolare app already available for the Italian context to the Senegal context too. In Italy, the app maps the different actors operating according to these seven business models, recovering and recycling, upcycling, bio-based and recycled input, 
life product extension, product as a service, sharing platform, reduction, impact and waste. For the Senegalese context, we decided to start mapping the first three. So re recovery and recycling, upcycling, bio-based and recycled input. How does the hub work? Uh, user side, uh, you can carry out independent or suggested research by product, by services, by business or initiatives, discover about the circular economy and the new trends by local, even online, and suggest new business products, initiatives to our team. We are currently working on implementing new features, do collective purchase, share hub contents with friends and create a wish list. Enterprise side, they can uh, talk about uh, their business and engage with a community conscious about uh, sustainability, efficiently promote their product, services and initiatives, sell their products and services and meet other uh, circular business. We are currently working on implementing the notification uh, services. Here you can see the mock-up both for the Android and iOS that we developed. The innovative elements of the project are mirror-like to the three main action designed as a solution. So we have the first element is the activation of a community engagement process for mapping activities. The second element is the activation of a capacity building process through training activities on the circular economy. And finally, the third element concerns a technological implementation. Mercato Circolare is the first app that creates B2B and B2C connection, promotes product and services for circular enterprises, allows users to purchase circular goods and services near them or online. Here you can see some data about the impact generated. 13 civil society organizations involved in mapping and in training. 90 companies published on the app and 50 still in draft version. 120 downloads of the app. Actually, uh, we do not yet start the promotion of the app because we need more company published on it and we need to complete the technological feature we mentioned uh, above. Finally, the activation of a network partners representing the different worlds, companies, states, associations, universities, NGOs, financiers, with the aim to reasoning about a collective governance of the projects. About scalability and replicability, we can say that we have won a new project present jointly, LVA and Mercato Circolare with other partners, to the last call by the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. And thanks to these new funds, we will strengthen and expand mapping activities, TS Dakar plus San Luis and Luga, and uh, we're going to develop a new future for the app. Here you can find our contacts, and thanks for your attention. Elena and Nadia, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to call everybody's attention to something that this project has shared with us. It is not really about the technology, and we, we heard that before during the institutional remarks by the founding partners. But uh, this project goes beyond the, you know, the uh, sharing of the technology that they have developed. When I, I really like that uh, of those three points that are the main pillars of your project, two of those are, are really on, on behavior. Uh, two of them are on development that engagement with the communities, but also making sure that you're working with the communities even before you start thinking of the technology that is going to help to, uh, to address the different problems. Um, just uh, before we go into the networking sessions, I would like us to all reflect on the differences between results and impact. So both are extremely important, 
but uh, um, not to be confused, uh, I think it's important that when, when we talk about, about the results of the projects, that we keep in mind that we see impact when, it's, uh, when we really deliver the objective uh, that uh, gave birth to the initiative that we, we were seeking from the beginning. So um, le when we go into the networking sessions, let's try to discuss more about that, about how we're delivering impact, how we're measuring the impact, evaluating and making sure that the targeting of our initiatives uh, is, uh, is being monitored, is being uh, reported uh, appropriately in, um, in our studies, in our presentations. So let me now invite you all um, to join our networking session. So please select the project that sparked your interest and go into that room. In case you want to find out more about uh, one project rather than the other, you can easily book a one-on-one -on -one session or post on the chat. So you will be given details on how to contact the focal points of the initiative you're really interested in. After the networking session, there is a lunch break. And during the lunch break, you will be able to book one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions. And uh, we will come back at 2 p.m. Rome time for the second part of the day. Opening our afternoon session will be Amel Amelia Cook of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So with that, I would like to invite you all to uh, leave uh, this room and join us in the breakout rooms for the networking sessions. Thank you and see you at 2 p.m.
welcome back everyone i hope that you enjoyed the nepotism and that you had a chance to enjoy also your lunch and also have an opportunity to book your one-on-one -on -one meetings i'm very pleased to introduce you to amelia senior chief economic policy manager at the ellen macarthur foundation where she leads the policy insights work and amelia's work is uh, driven by a belief that an inspiring positivity is essential for any large scale transformation Prior to joining the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Amelia worked as a researcher and consultant in Europe and Africa, covering various topics including migration, urban and urban development. Amelia has a PhD in international development from the Univer University of Edinburgh and is an alumna of the University of Oxford. Amelia, the floor is yours. Gladys. Um, uh, I just need to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Can you see that, Gladys? Yes? Can you just confirm with me that, that you can, can see, see the slide? Yeah, we can see we can see the slide. We just needed to be in presentation mode. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Perfect. perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gladys, as well. Um, as Gladys said, I'm the Policy Research Manager at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And at the foundation, together with my team, we develop and also communicate new circular economy policy insights to a range of stakeholders, from universities to businesses to governments. And I'm really, really delighted to be here. And I've been really enjoying listening to the first round of the presentations this morning. In my presentation, I'll be focusing on the fundamentals of circular economy and the key enabling factors, such as policy and finance, that we need in order to achieve the circular transition. However, before we dive into that, I would like to start my presentation with a short story. A month ago or so, I was in Kigali. Uh, I was delivering a circular economy course to African circular economy leaders and enthusiasts. And as part of the course, we organized various site visits to e-waste recycling facilities, to schools, and to universities that are built with sustainable building techniques, and also to a local fish farm that is trying to close the loop. I led the site visit to the Lakeside Fish Farm, which is just outside of Kigali, where we met the amazing founders of this place and we learned their story. The Lakeside story is a story of a couple who gave up everything to follow their dreams. The founders left behind their previous careers and they've been building this sustainable enterprise for over 10 years. They farm black soldier flames, they intercrop, they compost, they grow stevia below the fish ponds, and they keep various farm animals as well. They really try to close the loop in all of their farming activities. Uh, we had a privilege to meet with them and spend a day on the farm and kind of like visit all the different elements of it and understand that system that they are building. And this is all really, really challenging. And they were very open and candid with our participants. And they told us that they had years struggling to actually make ends meet. And they faced a lot of obstacles. At the same time, as you can see on these pictures, this place is amazing. It is lush, it is healthy, it is self-sustainable, it is food producing, and it is very innovative. And despite the many challenges they are facing and very candidly share with anyone who wants to listen and learn from them, They've really, really inspired our participants who until the end of the course told us that this was an absolute highlight of this trip. And one of the things that the founders of this farm shared with us that really, really stuck with me is that they told us that they're not giving up on applying circular economy and sustainability principles to their enterprise because they're in this for the long run. This is not... Um, and they explained to us that this is the only approach that will yield positive economic and health benefits for their family, for their business, and for their workers. And this statement really stuck with me because circular economy at its core, it's a system change agenda. It's not a quick fix. It's a transformative approach that affects different parts of the system. And it requires trial and error, testing new methods, and this long-term commitment and I think many of the innovators who are with us here today can attest to that. Being in this for the long run is one of the elements that leads to success. 
And despite the challenges, and there were really many, many challenges that the founders of this enterprise have faced, um, they persist and they continue innovating and improving and trialing new techniques and exchanging with other innovators. Because circular economy strategies, when they are fully implemented, they can lead to improved health outcomes, creation of stable employment, improved soil quality, retaining nutrients, and actually at the end, decreasing operational costs. And the circular economy system diagram, which is known as the butterfly diagram, illustrates the continuous flow of materials in the circular economy. There are two main cycles here, the technical cycle and the biological cycle. In the technical cycle, products and materials, they're kept in circulation through processes such as reuse and repair and remanufacturing and recycling. And in the biological cycle, the nutrients from biodegradable materials are returned to the earth to regenerate nature. At the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we define the circular economy by illustrating it through the following principles, eliminating waste and pollution, circulating products and materials, and regenerating nature. And then what's important for us is that the circular economy is built on these three principles and they're all driven by design. For us, circular economy is a new way to design, make, and also use things within the planetary boundaries. And shifting the system, it involves everyone and everything, businesses, governments, individuals, our cities, our products, and our jobs. So let's take a closer look at the three principles. The first principle, eliminating waste out and pollution. Did you know that waste and pollution are largely a result of the way we design things? So rather than treating the symptoms of pollution and then finding ways to deal with the waste once it's generated, the idea behind this first principle is to really design businesses so that waste or pollution are not created in the first place. And a great example of that is an American company called Appeal. Their innovation mimics nature in order to increase the shelf life of fresh produce by using the evolved defense mechanisms. So this technique is really designing out waste in two ways. Food waste is designed out because we're preventing produce from prematurely rotting. And we also eliminating the need for plastic waste with this technology, no man-made packaging is really needed. The second principle, circulate products and materials. In practice, this second principle means favoring activities that preserve the most embedded energy, labor, and materials. And it's important, it's these three elements. So examples of this include things like designing for durability or for reuse or for remanufacturing. And in the last resort, in the very, very last result for recycling. And when you participate in the local sharing economy, when you buy secondhand, when you reuse, borrow, rent or repair, all of this has a huge role to play in keeping products and material materials in use at their highest possible value. A good example of that second principle in action is a European company called Cirrus and they provide clothing subscription for children clothes. And this model, it allows parents to get the right clothing for the child and then they return it as the children grow. And we all know they grow very fast. So the system really allows to keep the clothing in circulation, exchange between different families and for the parents to purchase and kind of subscribe to the clothing they need for the children at this specific moment. And then finally, the third principle, regenerating nature, regenerating natural systems. We are beyond the point of no return in terms of environmental degradation. So at this stage, it's not enough to just protect and not pollute, but what we need to do is actively improve the environment. And examples of regenerating natural systems in a circular economy means things like deploying agricultural practices that not only avoid the degradation of soil, but they actually rebuild soil health over time. And in cities, this can mean things like urban greenways, urban gardens, supporting urban and peri-urban regenerative farming. A good example of this 
of regenerating nature, of this third principle of circular economy at a large scale is the Rizomo Agro. It's a company from Brazil. They are the largest producer of regeneratively grown grains in Brazil. And since they converted to this new approach, the farm has not only captured new markets, but also sequestered a lot of CO uh, tons of CO2 per year. But how do we move from these three principles to a system change transformation? What are the key enablers for the circular economy? Many things need to align for the systemic change, for the system shift to happen. Things like education reform, technological innovation, new financing models, and ambitious policies. Here, for the sake of time, I would like to focus on the last two elements, on policy and on finance. In order to achieve the system level change which circular economy proposes, how we develop policies, this will need to change as well. For a radical transformation, such as circular economy, we need a radical public service. There is some fantastic work that is being done by the University College London and their Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in how we can transform the current policymaking to achieve the outcomes we need. And sometimes because circular economy is so complex and so all encompassing, it is really overwhelming and hard to understand what kind of policies do we actually need to, to achieve the circular economy transition that we want. And in order to address this problem and kind of simplify this a little bit, at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we've created the circular economy policy goals. To achieve a circular economy, we'll need action at these five different levels, at these five different goals. First goal is about stimulating design for the circular economy. So these are the kind of upstream decisions, such as product policy, such as standards, such as land use policy. But we'll, of course, need other measures that can help us manage resources, such as policies on collection and sorting and EPR, and ex and, which is extended producer responsibility or waste classification policy. Goal one and goal two are kind of two sides of the same coin. But in order to make these upstream and these downstream policies successful and to help circular business models to thrive, we need changes to the economic incentives as well such as taxation, such as procurement and subsidies. For this new system to work well, we will also need to invest in innovation, which many of us listening and being here together are already doing. We will need to build new infrastructure and in invest in new skills for the circular economy. And finally, we need to collaborate for system change, and that requires new radical ways of collaboration, ways of collaborating that we haven't done before at new levels, both across governments and between the public and the private sector. And again, this is not just a theoretical model or a theoretical aspirational framework. We see policies that support the circular economy in practice happening and being developed and being implemented from Chile to China with many, many promising um, initiatives and plans. You can explore more of these on our website, um, reading the case studies that um, with our team we've written and prepared and are sharing and communicating. There's a really a lot happening already in this space, but there's so, so much more that remains to be done. And in terms of the second element, the really important enabler that I think many people who are here with us today really understand deeply and kind of work towards every day is the financing element of the circular economy. Crucial thing here is that obviously circular innovation needs investment and we must build the right foundations to encourage the money to flow to solutions which are creating a more sustainable society. However, all those circular solutions, and we know that are good for the environment and they're good for the economy, many companies that are innovating in this space are actually facing challenges in attracting investments for circular business models. And I think there are many people here, both investors and innovators with us, who know these challenges firsthand. Access to finance for circular economy innovation and enterprises remains a barrier at all different stages of development but especially for small businesses in the circular economy. 
And this is due to high interest rates and many other factors, but also for a host of other cultural reasons. And this barrier tends to be even higher for women and for youth owned businesses. Our uh, study with Bocconi University from uh, 2021 actually looked at this problem and tried to kind of like understand and address this. We looked at 200 plus listed European companies across 14 different industries. And our research has shown that the more circular a company is, the lower its risk of defaulting on debt and the higher the risk adjusted returns of its stock. But still, the risk premiums, despite this knowledge, for circular businesses are disproportionately high. And this adoption of circular practices has the potential to reduce risk, increase resilience through business model diversification, decouple economic growth from resource use and environmental impact, and better anticipation of stricter regulation and, challenge and changing customer preferences. So knowing that what we really need to achieve next is to move from grant financing and helping young companies to get their businesses off the ground, which is crucial and, and, and very, very important. But we need to start moving towards creating a financial ecosystem that will help these companies to thrive in the long run. And there's still a lot that needs to happen here. And I think all of us here have a role to play at the different stages of this journey. With scaling of policy and financial infrastructure, with growing understanding of circular economy strategy, with the risking of these ventures, we can create a circular economy where nature and people who are of course part of nature can thrive. And just in closing, I would like to go back to the words of the regenerative farmers that I met in Kigali, who told us that the only way to create a circular ecosystem is to be in this for the long run. So for all of us, I wish you to use your skills and your influence and your power to enable the flow of patient capital to circular economy innovations. And for those of us who are working in policy to continue creating an enabling and supportive policy environment for circular economy innovation to grow. We're in this for the long run. It's a system change agenda and everyone has a role to play. Thank you so much. To find out more, um, visit our website, theallenmacarthurfoundation.org, and you can also follow us on social media at uh, Circular Economy. And if you have any questions or any follow-up uh, questions for me, um, do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Amelia, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, just yesterday, we published a blog in partnership with the United Nations System Staff College and our um, colleagues, uh, Romina Cavatasi and Sinafi Kejemesa, were emphasizing the importance of making knowledge accessible. And the fact that, yes, we want to collect data, we want to collect evidence, but uh, the best way to convey the message that we want to convey is through a story. So I really appreciated that you started your presentation with a story to make all that knowledge, all that data and evidence uh, accessible to everybody that is uh, joining us today. Uh, very much would like to i would very much like to highlight something that you said at the at the end of the, your presentation which is that we all have a role to play in this yes access to finance is a big problem for the companies and for the organizations that are working in in uh, supporting the initiatives that, that go towards uh, the circular economy however if we have consumers that are always looking for for fast uh, fashion and and for um, you know, uh, instead of looking for quality, they just want to renew their wardrobe uh, continuously, then uh, we don't really have a market for, for those products and those initiatives. So the change, as you said, really has to be uh, a, si a system change where everybody contributes by the decisions, the choices that we make on a daily basis. And it's up to each of us to ensure that we do create a market for the products that are sustainable and that are thinking of the long run from the design phase. I would like now to move on to our second round of projects. The first project in this round of presentations is uh, valorization and resilience of local seeds in Nakuru by the Slow Food Foundation for the Biodiversity and Seed Team. The Slow Food Foundation for Biodiversity works for the protection of food biodiversity. The Seed Team is a project by the Italian University of Pavia. 
and together they aim to tackle crop biodiversity in Kenya. This team promoted a project that fosters sustainable agriculture based on local varieties and crops resilient to climate change in Kenya. They focus on the importance of adopting a local agroecological products-based diet. So with much further ado, I would like to welcome the team. Team, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> I'm here speaking on behalf of uh, uh, Slow Food Foundation for Biodiversity. Uh, we'll follow mm -hmm. Alma Balestrazzi for University of Pavia. Uh, today we are presenting the project, uh, as you say, Valorization and Resilience of Local uh, Seeds in Apuru, that had an implementation period of 10 months, from October 2021 to July 2022. Um, the partnership was composed by Zulu Food as project manager and the University of Pavia with the role of innovator. In particular, Zulu Food played the role of facilitator between the university and, and its local structure, Zulu Food Kenya. The target, uh, the target country was Kenya, specifically in Akuru County. Uh, the project focuses on, on community indigenous Maasai and Ojek uh, present in Akuru County. Particular attention was given to small farmers with a maximum capacity of two hectares of land. They mostly practice mixed agriculture, which includes the cultivation of local crops and livestock breeding. Uh, Slow Food in Kenya started uh, its activity in uh, 2004. The official uh, registration uh, as an, uh, a non-profit association in Kenya was in uh, 2014. Today, Slow Food Kenya is present uh, with Slow Food projects uh, in around uh, uh, 15 counties. Thanks to the collaboration with the local organization and authorities, uh, Slow Food Kenya has been playing a critical role in instilling positive uh, value on food, agriculture and environment. Thanks to Slow Food projects mm -hmm. that are Food Gardens, Presidia and Earth Market. Uh, the challenge we faced uh, with the project was crop biodiversity conservation. The three elements uh, characterizing the project were uh, sure uh, conservation of biodiversity, traditional knowledge, and resilience uh, of communities. By promoting sustainable agriculture that is based on local varieties and crop resilient to climate change, we tried to respond to respond of a general problematic emerging from key information show in the current slide. I, a data I would like to underline um, that uh, is that uh, in Nakuru County, farming uh, employs over 60% mm -hmm. of the total workforce. Around 80% uh, of whom are women. Um, the project starts uh, from the assumption that improving the technique of care and conservation of the input necessary to produce food contributes to solving the challenge of crop biodiversity in Kenya. Ensuring seed quality means strengthening the resilience of <coughs> local communities, as well as promoting conservation of biodiversity and traditional knowledge. The innovative solution proposed by University of Pavia focuses on three axes, seed priming, seed banking, and food knowledge. Please, Alma, to show in detail. Okay. Thank you, Venusia. So um, the know-how delivered uh, in this uh, project came from the University of Pavia and particularly as for the seed knowledge, uh, we have a long-term expertise on uh, priming uh, at the Department of Biology and Biotechnology and uh, as well as for seed banking and conservation at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. The idea was 
to use such a knowledge to support rural seed banks, minor village banks, and promote on-farm seed priming, as we'll see later on. And as well, the, uh, from the uh, food knowledge uh, uh, size, um, side, uh, the Laboratory of Dietetics and Clinical Nutrition at the University of Pavia has a long-term expertise in the issues of food knowledge, dietary diversity, and so um, by joining, by merging such expertise, you can see in the next slide, thank you, uh, how it was the uh, project roadmap. First, we started by designing the list of target species together with uh, um, uh, Slow Food Kenya. Then we prepared uh, a set of tutorial videos dedicated to seed banking, seed priming and food knowledge. And as for food knowledge, there was a questionnaire that was administered to the selected group of uh, women in order to assess the level of their food knowledge before the education intervention. And later on, we started to deliver the online lessons. The target were uh, a selected group of Kenyan agronomists. Then, um, in the uh, next slide, <laughs> thank you. Then, uh, then these agronomists, in turn, they were uh, training a selected group of small farmers. So they went to the different villages, giving both theoretical and practical lessons. And as well, after the food knowledge uh, training course, there was a second questionnaire that was administered to the selected group of women in order to assess their level of knowledge after the education intervention. And later on, there was a work to support, restore those uh, sites, those uh, places where already the small farmers are storing their uh, seeds in order to improve such conditions. Next uh, slide. Which are the innovative elements of our project? So, um, this is a know-how technology and an innovative tailor-made process dedicated to improve seed quality in terms of germination, conservation and protection. This approach um, uh, requires only minimal technological structures. And uh, again, another innovative element was this online teaching education course that we designed in order to target specific um, end users the agronomists, the, the small farmers, the women. And in the next slide, um, for, for the impact, for the results, we are very happy about the results of the project. In the case of seed priming, the small farmers, they were already using uh, priming, but in a very empirical way. So they started to follow our uh, suggestion and at the end, they got improved germination performance. And similarly, for the seed banking technique that was provided, they were able at the end to manage high quality seeds. This, the impact in terms of numbers, you can see here uh, 10 agronomists, 80 small farmers and 13 species used as local varieties in this project. Next slide. Thank you. As for the food knowledge, 92% uh, of the women that were targeted provided a positive feedback. Um, 50 women were selected. And so um, by increasing the food knowledge of these childbearing age women, we know that they are the pillar of the food system. We expect a positive cascade action in order to uh, improve their eating habits and health conditions, also of the surrounding community. Next slide, thank you. As for the scalability and replicability of our project, for sure, this is a simple technology, a simple innovative technology, easy to acquire. As I told you already, there is no need to purchase expensive equipment. It is low cost, easy to replicate. Indeed, this approach can be applied to other regions, other territories, that's for sure. And also, this means all also um, a, a strong networking opportunity for the uh, 
uh, actors involved. Um, our future goal is, uh, um, let's say, to build a seed bank facility um, according to the international uh, standards so that we can also contribute to enhance the technological and scientific level of these uh, of this, uh, um, uh, facilities. And the idea is to be able then to provide uh, in the long term high quality seeds, high quality materials for the uh, local uh, farmers. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. In, <clears throat> in Alma? Um, excuse me for that. Um, very, very, very impressive uh, presentation and all the journey that uh, you had to accomplish in order to achieve this level of results in the research that you carried out. Um, I found par particularly interesting your focus not only on research, but uh, on the last slides of the presentation. You talked about something that we haven't discussed enough today, which is affordability. The importance of, uh, of course, you know, uh, doing, f following your research journey, testing, learning, and adapting based on the results, the data, and the evidence collected, making decisions based on the on that data. Uh, but, however, what you mentioned before, and that uh, I think hasn't been mentioned enough today, is that all of this needs to be accompanied by training, which uh, your project uh, has and ensuring that uh, scalability is also based on the fact that the product is affordable for the for the end users. So thank you so much for that. That was a great contribution. Let's move on to the next presentation. The next presentation, the project is called Improving the Skills and Productivity of 500 Smallholder, smallholder Farmers in Meru County. Lentera Africa, together with uh, Color NGO and CEFA, work in sustainable development and cooperation. Their project aims to leverage on data analysis to assist farmers selecting the best means of production, agricultural tools, and market links for their crops with a verifiable impact on agricultural productivity. I would like now to give the floor to the team so that they can do the presentation. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I hope that uh, you can, I think that there was uh, some, um, yeah, our project is, uh, um it's called agro enterprise and um i hope that you can see my slide um uh, agro enterprise for sustainable development in senegal um uh, we uh we are presenting it the partnership was composed by engine and uh, mobic vitality onlus uh as you can see in uh, cooperation with the municipality of uh, ronk uh, NGIM is uh, a non-profit uh, foundation specialized in vocational training and uh, development cooperation in the Global South. Uh, in Italy, we are a uh, vocational training agency and uh, abroad we are present in more than 13 countries uh, with, uh, uh, with this focus on vocational training and uh, development, uh, uh, especially of uh, new enterprises. We have been uh, matched by the, by the program. We have uh, found this uh, new partner in Mobic. Uh, which is a startup designed to generate income from the surplus uh, of vegetable production in remote uh, rural areas. We have been working together uh, in the um, Saint Louis uh, region in Senegal. As you can see from the map, is uh, is the northern part of Senegal at the border with Mauritania, and uh, we have uh, been working in the municipality of Ronk which is in the department of uh, Dagana and uh, it's uh, a municipality characterized by a vast rural dimension. So the municipality territory is very uh, huge uh, in terms of uh, surface and it's uh, uh, divided in uh, 64 uh, small villages, small and, and uh, medium uh, villages with a very high percentage of uh, young people and uh, women living in the area. Um, NGIM is present in the area since uh, 2018, uh, working in, uh, in the local development, especially in partnership with the local uh, authorities. 
uh, the the knowledge we got uh, and uh, from the, our partners, from local partners, and uh, from the territory is that uh, agriculture is the main source of income for the 90% of the population, uh, so for the ma vast majority, and uh, local f uh, family farming is uh, really uh, a potential uh, source of economic, social, and environmental um, uh, growth, uh, but not sufficiently exploited at the moment. Uh, in fact, uh, a precarious food security uh, in the area is causing uh, serious human, social, and economic consequences. We don't have to forget also the impact of uh, uh, global change uh, regarding uh, the environmental conditions. So this is an area where uh, water is actually uh, not a problem by now, but uh, it's becoming more and more dry. And so uh, also local traditional techniques of farming and conservation uh, are now facing a big, uh, big problem in terms of uh, sustainability. What uh, what we did um, uh, together was focusing on the, on the on this challenge. So, on the fact of um, having a, um, um, giving a supply uh, to our uh, local uh, partners in terms of uh, entrepreneurial mentalities, uh, especially using a, a new sustainable te technological solution and uh, facilitating uh, uh, with the aim of facilitating the transition from a subsistence to a market economy uh, for our local farmers and contribute to sustainable and inclusive development uh, by supporting our local authorities. Of course, the assumption was that um, uh, the, the partnership was with Mobik could uh, help us in, in reducing food waste and uh, in using a uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, in order to uh, empower the community uh, uh, in, um, in, decent, in providing decent work to uh, young women and uh, young people living in the territory and uh, improving uh, the condition of local farmers. Um, what was the solution we, uh, we, we could implement with our project? Uh, we were uh, delivering technical training uh, together with Mobik uh, of drying, um, drying practices and techniques in favor of the representative of four local big farmers cooperatives. And um, we were delivering food safety uh, training in favor of uh, women of the villages, uh, training on marketing, and we were experimenting food transformation with the Mobik uh, solution. And in order to uh, know better uh, about uh, our um, about uh, our partner solution, uh, I'm uh, passing the floor to um, my colleague uh, uh, of Mobik uh, to explain better uh, the Mobik solution. Matteo, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Can you put the screen, the full screen presentation? Yeah. If you can. I'm so, yeah. Just yes. at the bottom, yeah. but it's okay. It's fully visible. I just okay. This is even better. Thank you very much, Mara. I'm very thrilled to present my solution here. I'm Matteo Matteini from Mobique, which is a startup from Italy and Senegal. It is actually born three years ago with the initiative of returnees, of uh, migrants, Senegalese migrants in Italy that wanted to go back to their country. And this is very significant to me. And we have um, we had the honor to take them back and to start with them to create some opportunities for their communities. And what we find out is that their communities were remote communities, agricultural communities, but we fa they faced a lot of problem due to the um, environmental deterioration, the brain drain and the poverty, but they still have a lot of resources. In fact, they, they produce um, uh, mangoes in abundance. And uh, most of those produce produce were uh, wasted, were going wasted because they didn't have the capacity of store them, transport them and to send them to the markets. So we find out this solution, which is a feasi feasible solution with, with most of the communities in this situation, which is a mobile factory. In fact, since then, we've been operating Mobik, uh, which is the mobile factory for resilient communities. Mobik is a um, is a pre-assembled container with inside the necessary to um, dry fruit, conserve them, 
and eventually to send them to richer market. So inside the Mubik, you have to, uh, you have a pre-assembled uh, production line, including a, um, a force air dryer to dry the fruits, uh, labeling scale, and uh, a vacuum sealing machine. And then at the end of the process, you have a composting so that the process is fully circular. And uh, the system is um, fully fueled by a solar power system so that we won't use any energy. Um, in fact, this is a self-sustainable um, industrial system, which is also mov movable. So you can uh, transport it from a community to another, making the most of the use during the year alone. Uh, th this was very practice because we could um, use the machine in several different communities and we fully tested the project cycle of mango produce at the beginning. So we transform waste, mango that didn't have any value because it was going to waste, into a high value superfood sold in mature markets in Italy and Europe. Um, so what we did was to try in the same solution and the same circular mode in different productions in the municipality of Ronc together with uh, Mara and Engie and the local cooperatives in a different produce that was the horticulture. And this has given us the opportunity to test the system into a different products and to put in use in different communities. And this was, a, was very interesting for us to test the feasibility in different type of businesses. But if you want to change the, the slides, Mara, please, um, I go to the conclusion and I say that the um, Mobic system come with the full package of a knowledge transfer because we can provide any possible community that want to try it, a training in waste management and in marketing strategies and in export management together with a lean management training. So in one to three weeks, we can create a full team able to produce from scratch to the end products. And this is what we are uh, willing to replicate in as much communities as um, as we can. Uh, I give the floor back to you, Mara. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, just uh, it's important to see together what was the impact of the initiatives, uh, the the number of farmers who uh, successfully passed the, all the technical training uh, given and implemented by Mobic uh, were 27 in total. There was uh, more than 50 percent of them uh, were women, and uh, we processed with the Mobic solution uh, more than 600 kilos of fresh agricultural product mainly okra, onion, and tomatoes that, as Matteo was saying, were uh, going to be uh, wasted and not it was surplus production, that it was transformed into dried product, product that could be sold uh, in, the, in the local market when uh, the local products are more um, uh, requested because they are not, um, not, not easily uh, on the market in that period. So it was a very uh, precious uh, initiative for our farmers because they could uh, diversify their income and also uh, they could give value to product that uh, could be wasted uh, in, um, uh, in another way. So uh, it was very important also to notice the percentage between the gross product and the dried finished product, which was the 11% uh, of the uh, weight. And this uh, is a very good percentage also according to the previous experimentation that uh, Mobik uh, had uh, with mango products in other uh, Senegalese regions. Uh, so the overall impact was uh, was uh, actually very good. We really thank the program and Mobik for this cooperation. Uh, we are leaving you also our contacts uh, in order to uh, to uh, maybe uh, keep in contact with us for further cooperation and further um, information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mara and uh, Matteo from NGIP and uh, Mobik SRL. Um, it's really inspiring to see two uh, a, a startup and a company from the private sector working so so focused into uh, increasing the, dur the durability of uh, fresh uh, produce. Uh, 
I really like your last slide on the impact that your project has uh, has delivered. Um, the focus on women and the fact that uh, among your beneficiaries, more than 50% of them are women, uh, farmers who you have trained and uh, brought up to a level that they are able to, to produce, uh, market and, and in a sustainable way their produces. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, moving on, we are going to now welcome the team of the project called Informed Decision Processes, pilot project of data collection among pastoral communities in Isiolo County. Action Aid is an independent international organization that combats, combats injustice and inequality. TRIM, which stands for Translate into Meaning, is a young and dynamic startup engaged in the field of innovation and technology with a mission to support decision-making processes related to the management of environmental and health resources by transforming data into actions. This project supported the digitalization of the pastoral ecosystem analysis tool, strengthening the community's capacity to adapt and overcome shocks. It collected, recorded, and analyzed agricultural data to support decision-making processes. I'm now pleased to welcome the team. Over to you, Josea, Elena. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm looking for the slide. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the quite good introduction and also the presenta presentation that has happened in the morning and up to now. Quite insightful and uh, very thoughtful. Uh, this this platform is quite informative. Thank you very much. This is um, a project for, uh, where we, work, we are working with the pastoralists to collect data and analyze them and make informed decisions with regards to their management of their ecosystem. I'm with the... Um, sorry. I'm with the... Um, Elena Christofori from Trim, uh, the co-founder and the chief scientist, and Amosea Kandagor from Action Aid. This, uh, this project has been implemented um, in Isiolo County, where we uh, Isiolo County is found in Kenya, northern part of the country, one of the arid and semi-arid uh, regions in the country currently facing a very severe drought. It's one of the worst droughts in in over 40 years now. Uh, this region has been experiencing uh, climate change and a lot of induced climate induced um, uh, effects, reducing the adaptive cap capacities of the community members. Isiolo County is one of the counties which has over 90% of its inhabitants uh, practicing pastoralism and uh, agro-pastoralism for their livelihoods. These two livelihood sources are... are Sorry, are Jose, I, I'm not sure if we are seeing your slides. Um, I just asked for confirmation because I don't see them. No, I can confirm that uh, they're, not, they're not showing. Yeah, so... Sorry, sorry. Are you seeing them now? Me not. Uh, let me see, let me try. Just a minute. Let 
Thank you. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, uh, go to the next slide, the target counting. Uh, this this project was, has been implemented in uh, in partnership between ActionAid and uh, Trim. ActionAid is a international federation. Uh, operating in 45 countries in an in independent manner, while Trim is a startup, uh, innovative startup working with the development of uh, disaster risk reduction uh, systems. Next. Uh, I'd mentioned that uh, Isela County being one of these arid and semi-arid re regions where majority of the past, uh, inhabitants are, are pastoralists, this livelihood is prone to climate change and climate risks. And you'll find that adaptive capacities of communities are at a very low level because of uh, the dynamic nature of climate change and also uh, issues, issues of uh, prolonged and frequent droughts. This calls for innovative uh, mechanisms, in innovative uh, tools for them to, to, to be adaptive and also to increase their, their resilience. Next. Yeah, uh, when you look at the current challenge in Isiolo, you'll find that uh, over 50% of the inhabitants are in food insecure, acute food insecurity. These are the numbers contributing the numbers which were shared earlier of 349 million people globally. And uh, being over 50% over of the inhabitants uh, being food insecure. And this is mainly due to land degradation, issues of uh, water scarcity and also Pasture depletion. We've we've had ex a lot of exp a lot of challenges with the uh, invasive species and uh, biodiversity loss. And this, we've seen communities already trying their best to adapt to these challenges and uh, build some resilience mechanisms, but it's not adequate. The ch the key challenge with this is communities are not able to track and also to relate what has been happening and also. To, to, to start up a community conversation model where they could uh, collect data and also analyze the trend over time for the uh, decision making. Next. So in, in consultation with the communities, we were able to look at various mechanisms, how to improve their uh, community mechanisms and to look at how they can come together and build a uh, sustainable ways of adapting to the changing climatic conditions. Pastoral field schools is one of these approaches which we've deployed. And this is a mechanism where the learners are able to reflect and come together and take uh, informed actions to tackle a common challenge. And it takes cognizance of the indigenous knowledge as well as the scientific knowledge and builds, uh, builds uh, decision-making mechanisms for supporting their decisions. This has been made, this was made successful with the introduction of a data collection mechanism uh, with the system. We referred it to as TreeMap Information Management System for the communities to be able to collect data and also analyze. I'll hand over to my colleague, Elena, to give the details of the system which we developed. Next. Welcome, Elena. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, 
First of all, uh, the first uh, innovative element was related with the uh, uh, people-led and commu community-based uh, approach. Uh, actually, it's true that we introduced a, a, an innovative uh, technology, but the human approach was the, the most important one. And therefore, some pastoral field schools were implemented uh, where uh, pastoralists can meet regularly and discuss about uh, uh, issues uh, about the relationship between what happens and the causes that triggers this project, uh, this problem, sorry. Uh, next slide. From a technological point of view, uh, we have been adapting the tree map uh, information management system to the needs of the project. Uh, actually, the tree map uh, uh, information management system is currently used in several projects across Africa to monitor uh, climate data together with the impacts and effectiveness of action taken, especially at community level. Thanks to this project, the flexibility, scalability and usability of the platform have uh, significantly improved. Uh, the system allows to identify valuable indicators for any project, uh, transform them into parameters that can be measured and monitored over time. In this case, you can see that we choose the body condition of livestock, height of grass, land use, or, or erosion. And these parameters can be transferred into digital forms that are co-designed with users so including also the icons, for example, the colors, so that everything is very, very meaningful, even to non-technical people. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, starting from the, from the design forms, data uh, were collected in the field through a mobile application, uploaded into a cloud database. Actually, everything can be done uh, except the uploading to the database, even offline. So the data can be collected, visualized through interactive maps, through tables, also without internet connection. On the other hand, as you can see in, on the right, there is also a web application, particularly uh, easy to use, uh, where data can be uh, seen through interactive uh, maps and tables, but also where administrator can perform data quality check, edit data, update data, but also overlay uh, the data, for example, about grass, together with other valuable data uh, sources, let's say the rainfall estimated from satellite or the vegetation index estimated from satellite. So there is possibility to track actually uh, causes, triggers and impacts over time. Next slide, please. Um, as a final step, uh, as I said before, uh, the goal was to bring data to pastoral field school to support data-driven decision-making. So again, using participatory approach, uh, two main tools have been co-designed, a Telegram chatbot and a dashboard to uh, disseminate collected data and uh, to the pastoral field schools and to support reflection about the evolution of the indicators over time together with the impacts of uh, the action taken. I hand over to you again, Josea. Uh, thank you. Uh, the biggest question would be, what is the impact of this uh, application? For us working with the pastoral field schools, these are community-based groups and initially putting putting the pastoralists together with a system that they could operate on their own and also collect data on their own and make analysis on their own. This has triggered a lot of conversation within the rangelands and expansion, adoption of this uh, uh, system into more pastoral field schools and also conversation around the communities where they are able now to have a conversation around certain practices that improves their rangelands and pasture production. We've seen also now other partners coming on board uh, where they would want to integrate this system into their rangeland management practices, as well as integrating data from the national uh, weather information and the forecast um, information. Um, going to the next place, next slide. Mm -hmm. 
uh, yeah. uh, next. With the flexibility and the the ease ease to ease of use of this machine of the system, we've been able to see it being adaptable uh, in the pastoral field schools, which is a bit harsh condition. And now this being able to work in that pastoral field school setup, this uh, system is is uh, replicable and adaptable to other geographical contexts as well as communities. As we build on top or on it more. Uh, integrating of other information which are necessary for the farmers. Uh, this, this scaling up this uh, system uh, to support communities in local locally led adaptation mechanisms. And this looks at uh, monitoring and supporting community-based adaptation mechanism. And we are currently exploring, replicating the, uh, the system among the village saving and lending associations. These are groups of women who come together to do their monthly saving, as well as transitioning to sustainable production system, uh, looking at agroecological production models. Keen at this is able to support them to track how they're establishing their food forest uh, and integrating uh, weather information, climate information, and also building the, the finance aspect in their groups where they are, we are looking at bringing on board a community established fund to support agroecological transition. Next. Uh, thank you very much for your following, following us and your attention up to now and keep in touch for further clarification and also continued uh, shared learning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josea and Elena. We had a rough uh, and rocky start uh, because of some technical issues with the presentation, but I'm uh, really happy that we uh, uh, went through with, uh, with it. And uh, thank you so much for some of the things that you shared. I would like to highlight Elena's contribution when uh, she described how important it is for your, for your team to make sure that you had a participatory approach that um, your project is uh, people-led, but it's community-based. Uh, so you have a, a, a really human-centered approach. The technology, however, is uh, super, super impressive. So it's, um, you know, you have focus on both. I mean, it's, it is, it is human-centered, but the technology that you have developed is also quite impressive. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Most impressive, I think, is also the, and I would like to learn more about this, uh, how your training program has delivered the, the impact that uh, you have assessed, uh, which is uh, making it possible for these communities to collect data and analyze this data on their own so that they can inform decisions and uh, base those decisions on the, on the data uh, that is being analyzed. So thank you so much for that. Let's move on to the next project. And I would like to remind the audience to please remember the names of the projects that we are seeing right now because we will be moving on to the networking session and it's important that you remember the names so that you can select the team that you would like to uh, focus on during the networking session. So let's move on to project number four, Eco Platform for Plastic Collection and Recycling in Mathar. Living in Slums is an NGO and research agency that carries out international cooperation projects and development programs in some of the poorest and most marginalized areas of the world. Value Bean SRL is an innovative startup working in the field of recycling and sustainability. This project is based on a new circular economy system in Mathar, which is one of the poorest and most marginalized slums in Nairobi. This team delivered a new system for uh, garbage collection that allows for a more organized management of plastic, recycling, and then selling to local companies in Nairobi. Tim, welcome, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just take this slide. Do you see them, right? Yes, so we can start. Uh, I am uh, Giovanni Fantoni Modena. I'm the co-founder of Valubin. 
uh, value bin, as uh, we will mention uh, later on, uh, it's been founded in 2018 at, and its platform, proprietary platform, Zeroed, uh, has been helping consumers in Italy to have a more sustainable uh, consumption. Uh, here with me today, there is uh, Silvia Razzi from Live Islams. Uh, ciao, Silvia. Please introduce ciao. yourself. Ciao. Hi to all. Uh, thank you for uh, this presentation. And uh, Live Islam is an NGO um, and also an Onlus Association, a research agency. And uh, we mm, have the coordination of many projects of international cooperation and development programs in the Islam of the world. And uh, uh, today we speak about uh, our project uh, in Matare, where we active from uh, uh, 2010. Great. So here again, our partners, uh, we are Valubin that developed Zero and Silvia is from Live in Slums. Uh, yeah, so Silvia, you can introduce a little bit. Uh... Yes. Uh, um, okay. Matare uh, is the second large, large, largest slum in Nairobi. Population is about uh, um, 500. 100,000 of inhabitants. Uh, the condition of uh, severe poverty of the slum is uh, without infrastructure, without uh, a garbage collection. And uh, our school, uh, the school that you can see in the photo, is uh, 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 oh, yes, is um, now host around uh, 300 students and uh, uh, become a point of reference for their family and also for the uh, neighborhoods. Mabatini is the district of Matare where we work. Um, we also also street children in our project of a civic center and uh, we organize many activity of sports like basketball and football and uh, we have built uh, a playground for the children of the neighborhoods uh, organize uh, uh, various activity for the women. Uh, we have a tailor shop uh, and also uh, activity of uh, dance and music school. And this is the new hour project. Great. So a little bit uh, more about us. Uh, oh, here well, maybe there. Yeah, there is a, an error in the slide, but uh, uh, he, uh, we are zero. Then we were. Uh, our proprietary platform from Valuebin SRL uh, in Milan. And uh, since uh, 2018, uh, we started developing our proprietary applications that could uh, uh, lead the consumers to have uh, a more sustainable consumption. What does it mean? That with our app, you can uh, uh, look online for the most amount of uh, uh, consumed packaged goods that you consume every day and you find very useful information. Uh, there are many on the Italian uh, for, uh, shape of, of the app, but uh, for the, uh, the Kenyan app, uh, of course, we had to, to narrow down the information. And of course, we decided to narrow it down to recycling information. Um, so uh, we found that uh, uh, Live in Slums were, was key to innovate uh, in this uh, in this field uh, and i let uh, uh, silvia describe how is the actual situation in matare islam yes uh, matare um, is uh, the, the inhabitant of matare lives in very uh, precarious hygienic uh, condition and also the um, we have a big problem we have a serious problem uh, for the large presence of plastic and uh, solid uh, um, waste, especially in the river that crosses the slum. The name is Matar River. And uh, um, as I told you, the population is uh, 500,000 inhabitants, but only for uh, one kilometer square. And uh, we have uh, a um, um we have also um, um there is no um there is no hospital there is no infrastructure uh, schools uh, and uh, all the service for the inhabitants are totally informal yeah so the the challenge is actually 
uh, very, very uh, strong. And, uh, you know, since Nairobi is uh, some of the biggest land seeds in the world, and Matar is one of these uh, the examples of it, uh, uh, we, we were aware before knowing live Islams how uh, life conditions for waste speakers are, are very hard inside uh, these uh, uh, landfills. Basically, they collect as many recyclables as they can, and then they sell them directly to recycling companies. Um, so the solution we found was how to merge our skills, uh, live in slums and zero skills, and, and put them together. So basically, we decided to build a recycling center inside live in slums school and uh, try to educate uh, the families uh, rotating around the school uh, thanks to the use of also the proprietary our proprietary platform zero so we built an app that was meant to be you know designed to be helpful just in kenya and in uh, possible other countries in africa uh, that was focusing on recycling information uh, yeah silvia uh, describe a little bit about how the center performed Yes, uh, um, the result of the project, uh, especially for the, um, the presence of the hub collection in Matare, is uh, sure training the population of Matare to separate the waste collection and create uh, an action to uh, clean also the slum for the, from the solid and plastic waste and uh, also we create uh, we create a new economic uh, link with the uh, company that we identify in Matare and in Nairobi um, between recycle center and the company to sell the plastic and uh, generating a new income for the inhabitants for the school where um, why not school academy our local partner and for the way speakers and for the youth group of way speakers that collect the plastic and uh, um, we provide the population with the uh, through the hub of value bin to identify the type of plastic and uh, the other um, and the other materials and uh, um, in, um, we we give also a new um, a new dignity to the ecological work of uh, waste pickers uh, operator because uh, we are guaranteeing them uh, better working condition and uh, uh, safe transport because now we bought uh, a truck for the transport of the plastic and also uh, a new vision of uh, this uh, profession. Thanks, Silvia. Uh, so the innovative elements, of course, were uh, uh, apart from the huge work in organizing the, the recycling center in the school, uh, how to uh, design the digital application that should educate uh, consumers and way speakers on proper sorting of uh, different materials. So uh, we worked uh, uh, along, of course, with uh, uh, partners in Kenya to uh, have uh, like the most the simplest uh, version of zero the, for that uh, uh, ecosystem and uh, so through the uh, the app uh, uh, users both way speakers and families could have a look at different uh, uh, kind of materials of course recognizing them by images uh, that could be you know very uh, specific uh, to uh, discern a different kind of plastics and different kind of other materials. Um, so, yeah, Silvia, the impact. Yes, uh, uh, the impact. Uh, um, the project of the new hub that we built in the slum um, is become a point of reference for all the inhabitants of Matare, especially for the district of Mabatini. And uh, we increase uh, our capacity and uh, sorting of plastic and other materials. And uh, we increase the sale of, um, sales of plastic in this moment. And uh, uh, the, the area around, especially the area around the school and the river is cleaner 
and eighter for the residents, and uh, uh, they are learning to take care of the to take care of it. Yeah, here, uh, yeah, if you can want want to say a few words on all these two points. Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier, but of course, the, the yeah. virtuous cycle of developing this uh, network, you know, with the existing recycling companies that, of course, this the center sells the recyclable to. So the way speakers come in, sell the recyclables to the, the school and then the school gather all this material and bring it uh, somewhere else this is the circles the, the the circular uh, aspect of uh, the, this project uh and so of course uh, these uh, gave uh, a new dignity to these uh, way speakers that could find uh, in this uh, virtual circle a sense a meaningful uh, impact uh, in their uh, surrounding uh, a couple of notes on the scalability and replicability. Of course, uh, uh, building other collection centers uh, departing from this experience uh, would be key to boost uh, the adoption of, of this model. And of course, the upfront cost of building the center, organizing the transportation of material will be, uh, you know, uh we will decrease the the upfront costs uh, by multiplying the recycling centers and uh, of course paying with speakers more adequately uh spreads the word uh, without any marketing uh, uh, campaigns whatsoever like uh, just by the, the fact that uh, we speakers receive more income for their hard work uh, spreads the word immediately to other way speakers that uh, work the the old way as uh, so to speak uh and uh, of course providing this kind of incentives uh to uh, recycling is really the best way to reduce the landfill expansion that we are witnessing in nairobi in kenya and of course beyond uh, kenya uh so this was it and uh, we would really like to keep in touch with uh, everyone interested in uh, our project thank you so much from uh, everyone at uh, zero thank you thank you so much um giovanni and silvia um i have to say that um, we've seen great presentations today your presentation was extremely good at making the business model truly transparent, truly clear. It was, I, I think that for everybody watching your presentation, it's uh, it's clear how your business model has been successful and the connection between your vision and the actions that you have implemented with the impact that you have been able to deliver. Very impressive that uh, you are, you know, in, in such a short period of time, you are already able to measure the increase in the income of the beneficiaries. Um, I really like that the business model takes into consideration educating not only the workers that are part of this initiative, but also the communities, the consumers, so that um, it's, a, it's an end-to-end -end, uh, solution. Um, really like your uh, approach to uh, no marketing, but word of mouth. There is nothing better than to have people that are ambassadors uh, of your initiative because they have benefited from the initiative and they're so proud and so satisfied with being part of it that they um, involve, they engage other people to become part of it as well. So congratulations for that. We are now concluding our round of presentations of the projects, and I'm going to invite you to join our networking sessions. So just uh, a quick recap of um, the presentations that we saw today. We, uh, we watched four different projects. One was valorization and resilience of local seeds in uh, Nakum by Slow Food Foundation and the seed team. The second one was the Agro Enterprise for Sustainable Development Project team by NGIM and Mobic SRL. The third one was informed decision processes pilot project of data collection among pastoral communities in Isiolo County by Action Aid and Trim. And the fourth one, is the eco platform for plastic collection and recycling 
in uh, Mathare by leaving slums and value being SRL. So please go ahead and select the session that you want to join and we will see you soon after the networking session is over. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. It looks like uh, people were having fun in their networking sessions, so we were having issues getting you all back in here um, to enjoy the rest of the presentations. We are looking forward to the next round of uh, project presentations. So let me move uh, quickly to the presentations because uh, we uh, we have taken advantage of the networking sessions, but have uh, also run out of five minutes uh, from the schedule. So. The next project is Agriculture 2.0 for Alito. CND Africa Mission is an NGO implementing development and international cooperation projects uh, between Italy and Uganda. Lentera Africa is a farm produce aggregation and agritech company supporting farmers. This project promoted sustainable agriculture through the use of new technologies that allow better management of resources, greater productivity, and enhancement of the agri-food chain from sowing to sale. Without much further ado, uh, please join me welcoming the team. Hi, Pier Giorgio. The Hi. Yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Gladys. Should be also uh, Moses coming in. I don't know. I will start. So uh, we are uh, two partners in uh, Africa Mission Cooperation Development, and Italian NGO, working in Uganda 50 years. And uh, we are working in different sector and uh, Lentera from, uh, from Kenya. Uh, what is uh, Alito 2.0 or Agriculture 2.0 for Alito? Alito is a formal leper center for children, and uh, we took over from the Catholic diocese. And uh, with all the structure, we, there is also three, 350 acres of land. And uh, when uh, we arrived in Alito, uh, we thought since the beginning to start an agribusiness center. So all the uh, renovation and uh, Everything that is done, we are going to do is concerning agriculture because uh, this uh, Alito Center in Kole District, Lango region, is really a place of agriculture. We have uh, a period of two seasons, uh, March, uh, uh, July, August, December. And uh, uh, we wanted to, to take this opportunity through this project to try to bring uh, especially the farmers, the farmers together. Uh, there is uh, this problem of uh, new uh, climate change. And uh, we realize and uh, we have to make the people aware that they cannot do agriculture as they have been done five years ago, 10 years ago, but they have to do and to adapt the agriculture to the new uh, environment, the new dry season, like this year, um, also here in Uganda, May and June, up to second week of July, no rain at all. So it has been a big problem for the farmer. And the innovative elements, uh, we can see there is uh, especially the, the linkage of uh, the NGO and uh, especially the private sector and the uh, application of simple and affordable um, uh, agriculture methods, especially uh, composting use of organic fertilizer, organic pesticide, not depending always on the chemical. That uh, the price also this year, since especially at the beginning of the second season, it has been a big problem for many for many farmers. Introducing a minimal of tillage no, is not need to move or to completely spoil the soil in order to have uh, a, a better product. And uh, making linkage to large international buyer of soya, maize, and uh, kia, kia seeds. Is the uh, uh, we know that who is making money is making money is not the farmer but the trader and the, the final the, the final buyer so and uh, here in, uh, in 
Lira district in Lango region. Uh, we have a lot of buyers that are coming from Kenya and from other parts to buy the, 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 the product. And, uh, and the, the, what we uh, try is especially to put together the, 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 the farmers and to link them to the, to the, to the buyer from, uh, from Uganda, from Kenya, and also at the international, uh, international level. And uh, uh, we have, uh, with the support of, uh, of Lentera, uh, it was, we started with an app. They created an app that is a Farm Connect app. Uh, this is uh, a good way, mobile app, uh, to support the, the farmers. The challenge that uh, we got uh, since the beginning is that especially the youth, they are not much interested in agriculture because they need, they want money immediately. They don't wait the season. Uh, we have uh, the big problem of uh, climate change, uh, difficulty in the preservation of the products. Uh, there is a study that uh, almost 40% of the, the harvest is lost between the, 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 uh, the when the, the, the harvest is ready to the market or to the table. And uh, for sure, the assets to, to the market. Um, the solution that uh, we put is capacity building of farmers uh, to create, to move, increase the productivity with a small, smart agriculture and uh, post harvesting training. That is where we got, uh, we took some time in order to help and to give how to keep uh, the product. And for sure, the new app that uh, that is entering like this. How was the impact? Uh, we got uh, uh, 41, 4, 411 farmers. Uh, before, I can say here, I forgot, we, uh, through Lentera, we train the facilitators, a group of 10 facilitators. After we train a group of 25 uh, model farmers, and uh, we then we call the farmers. And we got 411 farmers for one full week residential uh, uh, training. They came and uh, with the 25 facilitators, we formed 25 groups and uh, groups that they went back home it has been the uh, fact of VSLA uh, with these uh, groups that is a, a glue in order to keep the, the group together and uh, we had a chance to have just a part of the first harvesting suffering with a drought every group more or less got a gain of 3 million UN ceilings that is 840 euro Every family got 120,000 shillings, that is 33 euros. Uh, so the income farm increased uh, very much in compare, keeping, keeping, keeping in mind of the, the two months of the dry season. So, and the, uh, for sure now the groups, they are still uh, working together and sharing their experience together. They, uh, um, let me see, no, I jump, I think one, the up, okay. I would like to ask uh, 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 Moses to join here on, uh, on the matter of the app, please. Okay, thank you. Um, you can just go back one slide. Sorry. Um, the one that, yeah that one so thank you yes i think uh, for us as lentera africa so we are a private company a startup operating in the area of agritech um, in terms of uh, digital extension uh, climate smart agriculture and organic regenerative farming so it was uh, we really enjoyed uh, this uh, collaboration with the uh, copdev i think uh, uh, it was a great connection between uh, uganda and kenya uh, working with farmers there and also looking for markets within kenya um, I think one of the elements, as uh, Pierre Giorgio has mentioned, was the app uh, called Farm Connect. Uh, 
And this was a tool that we developed to uh, complement the work of enabling farmers adapt to climate change and also adapt to organic farming. So Farm Connect uh, mobile app provides many advantages to the farmers, as you can see. So we provide hyper-local weather updates. So they're able to see weather forecast in terms of rain, temperature, humidity, and wind. Uh, this year, drought was a big issue, both in Kenya and in North Uganda. So being able to see uh, the uh, expectation for rain in the season and know when to plant was quite useful. And then also the Farm Connect enables uh, uh, the communication between business groups, cooperatives to the farmers, also allows them to keep records so they can keep track of all the activities they are doing on the farm. Even for traceability, we can see uh, when did they plant, uh, when did they till, when did they apply fertilizer. And then also a marketplace where they post and see, I have uh, one acre of maize, I have two acres of maize, I have soybean. So this is, is quite useful. And then uh, one of the uh, innovative elements also is Ask an Agronomist module. So this is a digital extension where a farmer can take a picture, uh, send it to the a platform, and they can ask if, if they're facing an issue with a pest or a disease or crop nutrition, uh, they can post a picture and then get timely advice in terms of uh, extension services. So this um, was one of the elements in terms of the app. And as Per Giorgio has mentioned, within the wider context of enabling the, the climate smart farming, regenerative agriculture. And um, I can say in terms of the demos, uh, for me having uh, been to, to a little farm in Uganda, I saw a big difference between where we're doing the demo and where the farmers who have been trained and the neighboring farms. So there was a a clear difference like night and day. So showing that the regenerative agriculture, organic farming approach works very well and is actually better, not only for the soil, but also for the farmer's income. Thank you. So uh, what uh, we are thinking for the future after this experience together is uh, that um, uh, QT model to nearby farmers. A little, a little farm is, uh, it can be a hub. Uh, if for those of uh, Italy, maybe of my age, they were the consortium agrario. This place where the farmers, they, can, they were linked, where they could buy any kind of product concerning agriculture and also to eventually to sell to sell their products in, uh, at the, the, the consortium. The same we would like to create in, uh, in uh, Alito, where we have enough space because of uh, the, the buildings and the, and the farm and the, like this, this center. That uh, we can show in our farm what the people, the farm they can do, but at the same time, we can give all the support. They can be technical, so there will be some uh, uh, zootechnician people for livestock, agro agronomists for all concerns, the, the product of agriculture. And, uh, and this one can uh, also for selling, so that they, uh, to do like a, a serial banking, where the, the people can refer or we can buy in bulk or store for the period when a, a, a big seller, we can have a, a, a good price, a better price. We know that the important is to sell after January, especially February, March, April, but the people, they don't have storage. So to create in a, in a little the storage enough to, uh, to keep the, 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 the products of, uh, of the farm. Because the risk is to teach to, to tell them to uh, to grow to improve but after they have the last last uh, uh, mile we can say they like to sell their product so is to be near them through this app and for sure we have this uh, support with uh, Lentera that uh, according to us is the collaboration is going also beyond this year and uh, because we need the support and uh, from from outside, so this is what uh, uh, is in a, what happened in Alito, and what we would like 
to to look a little in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, per Giorgio and Moses uh, for that presentation. Uh, one thing that comes to mind to me is that I am seeing synergies between the different projects that we have had at the different uh, rounds. And uh, one of the challenges that you're facing, which is uh, storage, and has to do directly with, uh, with uh, produce durability. I wonder if uh, there is room for collaboration between your team and the teams uh, by NGIM and uh, Mobik SRL, because you seem to have uh, similar goals, uh, uh, even though you're working in different communities. So that that would be interesting to explore. Thank you so much. Um, I would like now to move on to the second project. So the, let me make sure that, because we have Lentera again here. So the second project is improving the skills and productivity of uh, 500 smallholder farmers in Meru County. I just want confirmation from the team that this is the right project. Um, maybe yes. through China. Yes. Can you? Yeah, yes. thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> good afternoon. So, Lentera Africa, together with Color NGO and CEFA, work in sustainable development and cooperation. Their project aims to leverage on data analysis to assist farmers selecting the best means of production agricultural tools and market links for their crops with a verifiable impact on agricultural productivity. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. So Luciano and Angelo, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. Good, good evening and to everybody. I am, uh, we are waiting for uh, Moses Kimani from Lentera to join us. But anyway, I will start uh, this presentation. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Fondazione Caripro and Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo for this opportunity. It's been really a, a good and important opportunity for us to, to test uh, this uh, connection and this cooperation with uh, another NGO and with uh, Lentera. Uh, my name is Luciano Centonza. I'm the desk officer for East Africa uh, for CEPA. Um, with us, there is Angelo Moratti, PMO of, of Color NGO, and we hope that uh, Moses Kimani will, will join us. Uh, it looks like he has some problems with uh, connection uh, in Kenya. Um, the project improving the skills of, and productivity of 500 small older farmers in Mero County aims to enhance the skills of smallholder farmers uh, producing coffee, fruits and legumes uh, in order to increase their productivity related to technical factors and knowledge that affect the entire production chain. Uh, we've been working with 500 small farmers, uh, 250 farmers, uh, coffee producers uh, uh, joining a cooperative in Meru, and 250 uh, farmers uh, producing fruits and legumes that uh, uh, throughout the, the, the project uh, had the opportunity to uh, join them into a, a cooperative. The partnership is between, uh, as I was saying, uh, CEFA. CEFA is an NGO, an Italian NGO working uh, uh, Kenya since 1992, uh, mostly working in uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, we are investing a lot in uh, supporting value chain and developing value chain because we believe that this is a, a, a good option and opportunity for the development of agriculture and for the um, enhancement of uh, life condition of uh, uh, people in, uh, in rural area. And Color NGO, uh, Color NGO Camminiamo Otto l'Orizzonte is an Italian NGO from Vercelli that uh, since 2002 is supporting the promotion of human person to international and social cooperation projects. And Lentera, Lentera is an African agri-tech uh, startup working uh, to enable farmers to adapt to climate change and increase their yield and income. Uh, the target country, the intervention is focused on Meru County in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, agriculture directly accounts for 34.2% of the national GDP. 
Uh, plus, there is a part uh, 27% indirectly through the link with other sectors. And agriculture contributed 76, 75% of total exports, uh, employing over 80% of the rural workforce. Um, in Merrow County, compared to the agricultural potential of the land, uh, there is a, a strong condition of other production. Uh, as I was saying, also in Mera, up to 80% of the workforce is employed in uh, the fields, but the scarce uh, technical skills and some external factors uh, do not favor the optimization of crops, the marketing of food and livelihood skills. Um, the challenge that we adopted is the sustainable food, food and agriculture, the problems that are limiting the development uh, in uh, agriculture sector are the low productivity of small form farmers, and this is caused by difficulties in the production, processing, and marketing. Uh, the high cost of production factors, the inadequate uh, technical services uh, to farmers, uh, poor institutional governance, inefficiency of cooperatives. Um, what we are trying to do, what we try to do is to organize the supply chain, access to means of production, pro uh, production processing and marketing in order to improve productivity and product quality. And the adoption of environmental and sustainable uh, good agronomic practices thanks to a digital platform uh, that allows farmers to control production in time, combining agronomy with satellite and aerial data and uh, for this, I give the speech to um, Moses Kimani from Lentera. Please, Moses. Thank you, Luciano. So I will again take us through the innovative elements in terms of uh, the Farm Connect app. Again, so working in Meru County with the cereal and pulses growers, so we had to adapt the app first of all to some of their key challenges. And many of these farmers are already organized into farmer business groups and cooperatives and in the process of setting up uh, together with Chefa and Color NGO helping them with the governance. So we, we took in this uh, structure and then uh, mapped it also within the app. So we said uh, we need to be able to communicate with cooperatives and members so cooperatives can post announcements uh, to their members. Uh, I think one of the cooperatives has about 3000 farmer members. So once they post these announcements, they appear instantly on the feed of their members as an alert. Uh, this is an improvement considering that uh, uh, they were relying on uh, paper-based announcements. Uh, I think uh, making announcements through the churches and uh, uh, local uh, meetings. So this enables at least the younger farmers, farmers who have access to smartphones to get instant communication. We also have uploaded several training modules uh, that are updated regularly. So this enables farmers to go through the training. So they've already gone through training through um, uh, the demo farm and on a face-to-face on -face training. So those lessons are captured in the app and they can watch videos, they can read text, and they can also do a small uh, course, a test to see how they are, are adapted to the training and get a certificate of uh, participation. You can go to the next slide. Yes, so in terms of a digital extension officer, so we're able to get, again, uh, a dedicated officer within Meru County who was uh, answering the farmers' questions. So there, uh, again, it was value, value chain specific. I know there was uh, pulses, there was cereals, there was um, coffee. So they're able to post and then get, uh, put a picture, ask a question, and also interact. So there's a, an authorized agronomist who responds to them, but everybody else in the community can also comment. Uh, they get weather updates, uh, farm record keeping tool. Uh, currently, this is a requirement, especially when they do traceability and uh, 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 certifications uh, for uh, if they're doing export crops. So they need to be able to track their uh, daily records. So they've been using paper-based uh, book, which can get lost or damaged. So doing this on the on the phone and generating a PDF quickly uh, is has a great advantage. And then marketplace. Again, it's able to connect people uh, together uh, with uh, buyers, aggregators, and their cooperatives to know how much produce do they have uh, after the cooperative. This is useful for demand planning and negotiation with, uh, with buyers and aggregators to know, yeah, we're expecting uh, 15 tons of maize. So uh, 
uh, this is the price that we're offering and it's available uh, within the next 10 days. So this is useful uh, to enable that uh, the farmers get access to, to good markets. So in addition, I think one of the uh, things that we had to do also was we had the assumptions around will farmers adopt this technology and uh, together with Chef and Kala NGO, uh, as part of the needs assessment, uh, we met first with a, a pilot group of farmers, then we uh, did uh, the larger group of farmers and I can say uh, within the younger farmers and even some of the older farmers there was very positive reception for using not only the SMS based tool but also the mobile app application and um, the feedback has been fantastic thank you oh thank you thank you Moses um, please let me give you the opportunity to give the speech to um, Angelo uh, a really good colleague and uh, what I want again to say, this opportunity from uh, um, Coop and Project was really an opportunity also to test uh, collaboration between NGOs. Please, Angelo. Thank you, Luciano, and thank you, Moses. Yeah, uh, this uh, Coop and Project was really an opportunity for us. And uh, um, one of the most important things since the beginning of the project for us. Uh, was to reach uh, a great impact and uh, we did impacts in uh, different fields uh, at first uh, the training that uh, we did to our farmers uh, both from uh, CEFA and Color NGO uh, we did uh, uh, some trainings that uh, in total covered uh, as beneficiaries 500 farmers in uh, agronomic practices and also in management and governance. Uh, in particular, the agronomic, agronomic practices training uh, led to a manual, a new manual for them uh, that covers different aspects like uh, environmental factors that influence productivity and management, uh, soil fertility, soil organic matter management, uh, chemical fertilization, soil erosion control. Uh, the management of the crop uh, and intercropping and also general principles of pest and diseases management and general principle for nursery uh, setting and management and uh, besides that uh, also uh, the creation of the digital platform that has been developed and that now is accessible uh, to managers of the cooperatives is a great impact for us and for uh, uh, the farmers that uh, have been involved in the project uh, about uh, uh, impact, uh, another impact that we wanted to reach uh, and that we reached thanks to the project was to give uh, uh, the most possible support to cooperatives, uh, to agricultural cooperatives, and uh, in particular, uh, CEFA uh, was already working with a coffee cooperative in Meru, and this uh, cooperative, thanks to the project, had uh, the opportunity to receive specific trainings on management procedure and improve management organization. But uh, if I can speak for color, uh, this was uh, a great goal for us uh, to create a new cooperative because uh, uh, the farmers that uh, uh, in the last period were working with us uh, did not uh, uh, have a cooperative yet. They were uh, working alone, uh, they were unorganized and they were facing uh, huge problems uh, uh, due to their lack of uh, power in the market as individuals. Uh, like they were producing, but uh, every morning, every week, uh, some dealers uh, uh, went to their fields uh, and they took advantage uh, of their products because they were uh, alone without uh, uh, power in the market of buying and selling. Uh, thanks to the project, uh, they joined, they established a new cooperative, a new agricultural cooperative that was uh, officially recognized uh, by the Meru County government. And we can see the, the certification here. And uh, uh, this was a great goal for us. And thanks to Coop and we could do that. So great input both for the cooperative CEFA and Colin. Dealing with the, the theme of scalability and replicability of the project, uh, we know that this was a pilot project for us and uh, uh, scalability and replicability uh, since the beginning was our goal. Uh, we think that uh, this uh, project can be replicated on wider audiences. Uh, for example, um, the idea now is to extend the use of the digital application 
to other cooperatives that uh, are involved uh, in the coffee value chain, uh, a project which uh, now is uh, currently implemented by CEFA in, uh, different, in seven different Kenyan counties, and that is involving uh, around uh, 35,000 farmers and uh, also to other Kenyan farmers that uh, are, work with, are working with us uh, with color and so um, according to this data it is clear that uh, the possibility to extend the, the impact of this, uh, of this project and of this digital solution is uh, very great. Uh, in addition, uh, this request to have a platform, for, a platform that is uh, easy and usable also by non-literate farmers uh, put uh, us and as NGOs and uh, innovators in a position uh, to have a tool that can be extended also to other supply chains, uh, not only coffee or vegetables or beans or cabbages, but uh, potentially to uh, different uh, kind of uh, crops uh, and beneficiaries. Mm. Okay, the, mm, here you can find some of our contacts uh, if you want to take contact with us uh, and keep in touch. Uh, just to conclude, uh, I also wanted to say a very big uh, thank you uh, to Moses and to Luciano because we worked uh, very well in this month uh, and uh, this is an opportunity for new projects and uh, uh, new, yeah, new projects together also maybe with, uh, with Caripro and the Dogs. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Luciano, Angelo and Moses for the presentation. Moses, uh, good to see you again in uh, two projects by Lentera. Um, I'm very curious to learn and maybe this is something that can be discussed later in the networking sessions, but uh, very curious to learn more about this hybrid uh, model that you have for the development of skills and also curious to learn uh, what happens when there is no connectivity. So uh, if you have addressed that and, uh, and if you have made the solution also available offline, but that's uh, for the networking sessions. We are moving on now to our third project. The name of this project is uh, Innovative Technology at the Service of a Sustainable Agricultural Model in Burkina Faso. Fondazione ACRA is an NGO that has worked in international cooperation for over 50 years, focusing on protection of human rights and in the fight against poverty and inequality. Wi-Fi for Agri, Primo Principio, is a young com community, um, sorry, is a, a young company that offers ICT services for rural and agricultural development and for environmental monitoring. This project aimed at increasing the knowledge and skills of local technicians to better face agrotechnical challenges while increasing the resilience of rural communities to climate change. Tim, please uh, join the floor. And uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead, Andrea, Bryce. Um, go, please, when you want. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kudugu uh, Blis Nikodem. I'm going to present with uh, Andrea Galante our project. That name is uh, Innovative Technology at the service of uh, a sustainable agricultural model in uh, Burkina Faso. So the project uh, has uh, implemented uh, by uh, two partners, ACRA and Jews as uh, a leader and uh, facilitator to implement the project in, on the ground. And uh, Primo Principio, as an uh, innovator uh, that uh, support the project uh, with uh, the innovative technology Y4 Hagri. So where uh, was the project implemented? The project is uh, implemented in uh, Burkina Faso because uh, this country has uh, 80% of our farmers among the population. And uh, despite this uh, percentage of our farmers, the country is uh, struggling to achieve the 
to achieve the goal of uh, food self-sufficiency. Also with uh, the security context due to terrorism attack, many persons have uh, abandoned their, their place, including cultivable land to move in a secure area. We have also climate change, which has uh, accelerated and uh, caused a strong degradation of uh, cultivable land. And uh, this, all these things are making uh, Burkina Faso a country where uh, most of uh, people struggle to, to feed themselves adequately. So the project was uh, implemented in uh, Lumbila because Lumbila is uh, very close to Ouagadougou, the capital, and uh, in this way we can uh, easily work every time when we want to in the field there. And uh, here we have uh, the location of the uh, five target fields where uh, we test the use of uh, the innovative technology Y4 Hagri with uh, five target farmers. And uh, the challenge adopt the main challenge here was to raise awareness and uh, knowledge of uh, about uh, 80 farmers in uh, the municipality of Lumbila and uh, also to test and uh, experiment the use of the Y4 Hagri technology in uh, the production of vegetable like uh, onion and uh, eggplant. So the problem here is uh, the fact that with uh, the harmful effect of uh, climate change, many farmers don't have uh, the skills and uh, the capacity to deal with uh, this harmful effect of uh, climate change. And the most people affected by uh, this problem are uh, small farmers, rural communities, and uh, in general, uh, the population of uh, Burkina Faso. The consequence as uh, as the fact that uh, we have uh, many persons that can cannot eat uh, sufficiently. For example, uh, in a rural area, most of uh, people eat just one time per, per day. And also, the farmers remain in uh, a poor condition, so they cannot uh, take care of uh, their family when they harvest their food. This is due also to the lack of use of uh, technology in uh, agriculture in uh, Burkina Faso. So now I'm going to let uh, my partners, Andrea, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Brice. Hello, my name is Andrea Galanta. I'm the representative of Primo Principio, which is a cooperative that works in um, agri-tech technology to, for supporting um, sustainable agriculture. And uh, we try to talk about the solution we tested during this pilot. Um, first of all, we identified with the help of ACRA, we, um, our first step was identificate the cooperatives and innovative farmers and target crops to work with. And then we uh, selected to work in, in the irrigation um, teams, so the, in the field of the irrigation. Then we understand which kind of a customization of our technology that is made up software and hardware parts was uh, needed to do. Then we installed the sensor and the weather station in the field. We test the, um, the, the equipments from different point of view, connectivity, working correctly, etc. Then we trained uh, ACRA personnel and farmers in using the software and to enter data into the, the software in order to, to, to get their data, 
to uh, have in the end uh, data analysis and output uh, guidelines about best practice to, to perform with the help of the software, uh, which are innovative, which has, has been the innovative element that we try to, to put. Uh, first of all, they keep, all the equipments were energetically independent with solar panels. They were plug and play and easy to use. So something that is very easy to scale and replicate in other contexts with, without too many problems. Then we uh, try to adapt the, our platform and our app uh, to some insights that came from Accra and uh, try to uh, customize the both the graphical user interface and uh, some menus or uh, features in terms to be used uh, more easily from the, the people, from the, the community. And then we adapt uh, our app in order to be used also offline, so in the remote areas, in order to gather the data in the place that we have no internet connection and uh, um, force the app to, to upload the data once the, the connection was re-established. And at the end, we uh, provide uh, education, best practice and guidelines for um, agronomical uh, techniques and strategies based on data analysis and comparative study that we uh, carry out during the pilot. And uh, what was the impact? Uh, the impact was um, we tested this technology with the five target farmers. We contribute to the awareness of about 30 farmers and uh, we, we visit also them. We contribute to the awareness of uh, 438 persons in three villages by debating on climate change, public debate. We train three members of ACRA and five local technicians to use our, our Wi for Agri software. And uh, we train 30 farmers on the harmful effects of climate change and the resilience techniques to deal with it. Uh, about scalability and replicability, uh, that was the, our, our goal from the beginning as, uh, as is, uh, it was interesting for us to replicate in other con contexts. So the first point is that achieving food supply uh, while minimizing the negative impact of this, uh, of the other production is a common problem. So it's something that is a problem that is unfortunately common to, to find. Uh, again, the installation of the sensor is very easy and fast. The sensor is plug and play and they don't need maintenance. So it's easy to work even in a remote condition. Um, the solution uh, is very easy to use just with a very short training and also the documentation and the wikis are available on the cloud. So it's very easy to replicate this, uh, this experiment in other, in other context. Um, so it was our uh, last slide. Uh, here you find our contacts if you want to send our message or uh, get more information about the project. And I also want to thank Brice for the cooperation and thank to our Copen organization, Cariplo, and uh, uh, for give us our, our this possibility that uh, was very interesting for us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you so much, Brice, as well. This is a wonderful collaboration between uh, Primo Principio and ACRA. I see how you're both leveraging on the strengths of each of the organizations to improve your, your project and really looking forward to uh, where you're going to take the this uh, product in terms of scalability, um, you know, to give to give to it also a statistical relevance uh, in, in making sure that all this hard work that you have put into developing an app that uh, that is available both online and offline is really optimized and scalable. So uh, moving on, we are going to see the presentation of our fourth project, Value from Waste. This project is by Fondazione AFSI, which is a foundation engaged in development cooperation and humanitarian aid projects in 39 countries around the world. Marula Protein uh, instead is a private sector company that converts organic city waste from food markets into a sustainable animal feed and crop fertilizer. Their project focuses on the transformation of organic waste collected in the urban markets of Kampala to produce animal feed and organic fertilizers using black soldier flies. I am very pleased to uh, welcome Francis. Uh, it's been a long time I haven't seen you. Good to see you again. 
and Dennis. The floor is yours. All right, I think uh, Francis connection might be off. Um, so I will just take over in the beginning and until Francis is back, it seems to be frozen. Um, so our project uh, was started from waste. Thank you. Sorry, Ali, connection issue. Yes, my name is Francis. Yes, there we go. Uh, I am the, I work for RC as the focal point for agriculture. Um, let me start by by thanking uh, Cariplo and uh, Fondazione San Paolo and all the other partners for this opportunity to present this project that we implemented in Uganda in collaboration with the Marula Protein. This year, AFSI has celebrated 50 years of intense work in the last mile, mainly to really bring lasting changes in the lives of the communities in which we work. And our mission has always been to implement uh, cooperation projects uh, with preference to education in order to uh, accompany the persons that we work for to a journey of self-discovery so that they really become in charge of their own journey, their destiny. Um, so agriculture is one of the sectors in which we intervene in and the main uh, priority that we have there is uh, contributing to food security and also using it to socioeconomically empower women, smallholder farmers and the youth. And so we try to, to, to facilitate the integration of these people that we work within the agricultural value chains. And so we have done quite, quite well in the different nodes, uh, except in the area of waste management. Yet we are now in a period where with climate change and rising population, we have to find innovations to get more from less. And so uh, Copen gave us this opportunity to do an innovation with a private sector actor that's uh, Marula Protein, who offer 21st century solutions to global issues. And the fact that they are quite well embedded in a node of the value chain that waste management that we're really interested in to complete our circular economy loop in our in the integration process that we are interested in. Next slide. So this, uh, next slide again. Yeah, so this project was implemented in, in uh, Uganda, a country that is still uh, facing a, a lot of challenges uh, in terms of human development in itself. The GDP is still quite, quite low, yet the country has a very enormous potential, especially in the agriculture sector where over 75% of the available land is arable, yet only 56% of that is used. And on the other side, um, it's the main uh, export sector of the country. So a lot really needs to be done here. Next. Yeah, so um, the challenge that uh, AFSI and protein adopted was one in the area of waste management uh, where the uh, accumulation and the management of waste in the urban areas had, be had become or has become a public health hazard and also an issue for the environment where on a daily basis up to 3,000 tons of uh, waste is produced and 80% of that is organic and then on the other side also when you look at the agriculture sector access to input is a big problem we know how important fertilizers are and then also the level of knowledge is quite quite low among the smallholder farmers next slide yeah so in our innovation uh, the proposition was to use the black soldier flies to process the organic waste 
and this is this was a business model that protein presented and so we had to do the collaboration with the with the local authorities uh it involved purchasing of a truck that should be gathering the waste from the city market to the processing plant next yeah and then on the other side also improving the knowledge of the members of the communities the youth smallholder farmers and women was quite quite crucial for the future uh, adoption and scaling of the technologies using the black sort of fly so we set out to identify and then train uh, ugandan youth of which 50 percent were women and so a total of 150 farmers Again, half of the women were targeted to be trained in this BSF technology. Now I will invite Dennis uh, from uh, Copen, no, from uh, Protein to take us through the innovation and the results that were achieved. Daniel, you're most welcome. Dennis, I mean, thank you. Yes, th thank you, Francis. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dennis, I'm the CFO of Marula Protein, um, and I'll be going a bit more into the innovative elements. Um, so basically what Marula Protein does is we collect uh, organic waste uh, and now that's mostly municipal waste in the city of Kampala. Uh, we process that and then we put it into trays and we uh, enter black soldier fly larvae into these trays. So what, what happens is that these black soldier fly larvae will start eating the organic waste um, and the, the larvae will grow about 50 times in their biomass. Um, so uh, there, there's basically two main outputs that, um, that, that, that you have from this process. One is the larvae themselves, which are a very high source of protein. So for example, this is a very great source for, for farmers, uh, to feed their livestock. So think about chickens, uh, pigs, um, but it also, for example, works for tilapia. And then the other is that the organic waste uh, that's being eaten by the, by the larvae is, um, yeah, simply said pooped out and it's a very great fertilizer um so we really turn organic waste into uh feed and fertilizer with this process of uh, black shoulder um and our aim is to basically get this to as many smallholder farms as possible so on the one hand we have our own operation uh, right in the middle of the city where we create our feed and fertilizer but on the other hand we also have our own breeding hub where we grow um the black soldier flies and we're now currently expanding into uh, networks that reach as many black soldier fly uh, or uh, sorry, smallholder farmers as possible so that they can buy the uh, black soldier fly larvae and actually apply to their own waste uh, in a little shed or on the side of the operation. Um, and they can take their organic waste from their from their farm operation at the black soldier fly and get feed and fertilizer themselves. Um, so there, there's all, there's clear clear impact. So one is waste management. So of course, uh, we will continue to work with the municipal waste. Um, but this will also increase the efficiency of the waste. So it's it's for most farmers, it's now a cost or they apply to the land, but it's not super efficient. And we create a very efficient fertilizer. Um, and if we, for example, compare it to artificial fertilizer, it's up to three to four times more efficient if you look on it on an impact and cost basis. Um, and then on the other side, we also increase um, yeah, the workforce here in Uganda. So not only directly. So of course, we, uh, we hire many Ugandans in our factories, uh, in our breeding hub. And as we scale up, uh, we will continue to do that. Uh, but also through the, through the fertilization of the land uh, and to the, through the trainings that we give on how to actually apply the, apply the fertilizers and the black soldier fly technology, uh, we increase efficiency and, and create more jobs. Um, and again, 50% of the women that, or farmers that were trained were women and also in our factories, 50% uh, are, are women. Um, so this is a more, more long-term picture. So I talked about the youth farmers, I talked about the fertilizer um, and the feed, right? So it will make the, the livestock more efficient as well. But also on an environmental level, it's really good. So um, the waste uh, puts these uh, hurtful particles into the um, into the atmosphere, which through our process doesn't happen. So we have uh, CO2 avoidance, 
Uh, we're also working with biochar uh, to to actually sequester the, the the CO2. But as you can see on on the right hand side, it's it's a bit small, but um, actually seven uh, kilograms of CO2 is avoided by one kilogram of black soldier fly product. So compared to alternatives and 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 the current state of affairs, uh, we're actually CO2 negative. Um, so that, that's also an impact for the long term and for the planet. Uh, so in terms of scalability and replicability, that's actually the stage at where the company is at right now. So we're trying to expand the reach of the black soldier flies. Uh, so, so through selling the larvae, you can see a picture here on the screen of one of the trainings we did. This was actually uh, three weeks ago, where we invite small, small um, scale farmers to our premises. And we showed them how to how to apply the larvae to the waste, uh, you know, give them enough oxygen, don't put them too deep. Um, and then they can, of course, give it on to their communities. So uh, our goal is basically to uh, increase trainings. So up to 1,000 farmers. Um, we will directly train 300 farmers in the West. So that's a, that's a program that we're setting up now. And overall, we train 7,000 small-scale farmers on uh, good agricultural practices. So that includes how to actually apply uh, the fertilizer. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's a good picture of, uh, of what Marula Protein has done in combination with uh, with Opsi, and we will continue uh, this path forward, increase the product production of black soldier flies, um, and tap into networks. So if anyone here uh, sees you know an opportunity to work together with us to tap into a network that can reach as many farmers as possible, uh, please reach out to us. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Dennis and Francis for the presentation. I have to say that I've been lucky enough to be able to visit some of uh, uh, Fondazione Apsis projects in the field and it's really impressive what they do, uh, the way that uh, they design the training for uh, their beneficiaries. And uh, Dennis, you didn't mention it, uh, or, or at least I, I think I missed it, but I think that one of the greatest impacts of uh, your project is the linkages that you're creating between the training and um, jobs for youth in the in the communities where where you are working, I'm fascinated by alternative protein projects and how innovative they are and the solutions that they are providing to some of the challenges that we're facing. This product this project is particularly interesting. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure that people have lots of questions for you during the networking sessions. I just hope that they don't take so long to get back to the main room like we did in the previous uh, networking session. Um, let's move on to the next presentation. Um, let me go back and actually, um, no, actually this, uh, this project uh, concludes our round of uh, presentations. So uh, let's move on to the networking session. I would like to ask um, our backend team to please share with us the slide with the names of the projects to make it easier for everyone to select the, the rooms. So there you are. We have Agriculture 2.0 for Alito Uganda with CND and Lintera Africa. Uh, the second project is improving the skills and productivity of 500 smallholder farmers in Meru County, Kenya by CEFA Color NGO and Lintera Africa. The third project is Innovative Technology at the Service of a Sustainable Agricultural Model in Burkina Faso. This is by Fondazione Acra and uh, Primo Principio. And the fourth project is Value from Waste in Uganda by Fondazione AFSI and Marula Protein. So uh, please select your favorite project and uh, we'll see you back after the networking session for the keynote speech by Maximo Torero of FAO. See you soon.
Welcome back everyone. I hope that you had a chance to ask all the questions that you had um, to the different teams. And uh, I'm not sure if Maximo has joined us already, but we have had a really, really interesting summit with great projects being featured, great teams and amazing ideas, amazing solutions that are um, delivering truly impact in the field. So I'm now very, very, very pleased to welcome our next keynote speaker, Maximo Torero. Chief Economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Prior to joining FAO in 2019, Maximo was the World Bank Group's Executive Director for Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. Before working for the World Bank, he led the Division of Markets, Trade, and Institutions at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Maximo's major research work focuses on analyzing poverty, inequality, the importance of geography and assets in explaining poverty, and in policies oriented towards poverty alleviation. Maximo, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is no, yours. A pleasure to, to be here. Uh, and thank you. I was able to follow some of the of the presentations, so I, I, I hope uh, what I will do will be helpful for all of you. So let me try to, to share my screen. I, I hope you can see it. Uh, can you see it, Gladys? Yep, okay. Yes, can you see it? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No, no problem. So so what I will try to do is try to, to bring some ideas. I will focus on one innovation, of course, one type of innovations. Uh, but, but I think uh, the idea of innovation for the agri-food value chains and agri-food systems in general is something that we have to do now because today the only way we can move forward in, in achieving what we need to achieve is if we uh, prepare for the future and what we have observed uh, lately is that the future is very uncertain and, and very risky and that's where we have to bring innovation and science to try to find solutions to that very risky world just to give you some examples late examples uh, on the last two years, what happened in the meat industry. No? Uh, here you have the before and after. The before was people working together uh, and, and doing the processing of meat industry, which was not so automated and was not uh, so respective of the food safety issues. Now, because of COVID-19, things change and they have to figure out solutions because many of the bigger plants, even in developed countries in the US, were closed. 
And this is a U.S. plant, which is still is not fully automated. But if you go to Europe, uh, most of the plants are, are fully automated. So technology had uh, moved very fast and, and response and innovation responds fast to, to the challenges that we are facing. And the agri-food system has significant challenges. The same is happening with robotics and automa automation. Our latest SOFA publication is exactly on this topic on automation uh, and how automation has evolved over time and what are the challenges. Uh, and one of the things that, that we face right now is not only the technology itself, how much it is not scale neutral, meaning that not necessarily small holders will be able to use it because if it is not scale neutral, you don't have the money to, to afford it. But it's evolving towards a technology which is scale neutral. And here you see in the left hand side these little robots uh, that are miniature robots that do soil sampling, soil mapping, many things that we couldn't do before. And on the right hand side, you see how the processing plants are evolving, looking more like an Amazon uh, storage facility rather than a food processing plant. And that has effects. It will have effects over labor force, it will have many, many effects. We are also observing uh, horizontal farming and vertical farming. Horizontal farming, we knew two years, three years ago, was already cost effective, uh, but vertical farming was not. But today, vertical farming is becoming to be cost effective. The latest one I saw was a, a 90 building floor of, of peak production in China, uh, which was completely designed taking advantage of the idle capacity of buildings uh, because of COVID-19. and and was keeping the highest standards and, and it was completely cost effective. So things are evolving uh, and things are changing. And one of the more progress mm -hmm. one has been e-commerce. No? We have seen how we get short, closer distance now between the producer and the consumer and how e-commerce has helped to accelerate that process. Of course, this will evolve and will have differences according to countries and according to places where we are and according to certain parameters that we need to have in place for this to happen. In the case of e-commerce, you not only need the broadband, not only need the digital platform, but you also need the delivery system. If you don't have the delivery system in place, then it's very difficult to happen. But what, what re reality has shown us that uh, the platform could be there, the connection could be there, and then somebody figures out the delivery, no matter how far you are. So again, a lot of changes, a lot of innovation. Now, what, what, what is where I am looking for and where I see a lot of the innovations you're trying to do because I have seen innovations on, on soils, innovation on how to manage losses and waste, innovations on digital technologies. Is at the end of the line, if I go just in the digital world, which is the, the one I would like to, to focus today, most of the data that we have today in, in the agricultural system is your spatial data. And although the technology of automation and precision farming has been initially designed to be non-scale neutral, meaning that it's done for big farms, this is evolving and this is changing substantially over time. So today we can produce, if we have the soil information uh, and satellite information, we can produce information at three meters by three meters that can be a public good and can be accessed by small farmers. We can know how much blending of MPK they need. Uh, of course, there is investments that are required to achieve that level of public good, but that's the role of entities like IFA, like FAO. We need to find ways to create those public goods because the small farmers won't be able to afford, like the large farmers. So we need to put them in the same level. And that's where we bring these public goods and type of information, similar to the app that you were showing uh, today. But it's not easy, it's complex. Also, institutions have evolved and you have today ways in which for example you can share a tractor so if you have one hectare you don't need to have a tractor for yourself but you can share a tractor there is the uber eat the uber tractor and many other ap applications to to share this type of technologies even there are companies that do the delivery of the services so scale neutrality is approaching there are innovations institutional and technological that are allowing to to bring that scale neutrality but digital technologies have revolutionized agriculture and they are they are at the base of, of precision farming. And, and my goal at the end as FAO is give precision farming to smallholders because those are the ones that have the less budget. So those are the ones that have to use the inputs in the most efficient way to get the highest return. And connectivity has improved dramatically. But as in many other innovations, there are huge challenges. And what I'm going to say for digital applies, I think, to many of the innovations we have been uh, discussing today. Uh, so it's not only digital in itself. In the digital reality, yes, we have challenges of access. We have challenges of the inequalities. 
we have challenges on the network coverage and the, and the intensity of subscription. We also have challenges of access to energy, literacy, because if you don't need how to read and write, it's very difficult to use these technologies. And skill sets, uh, affordability is still a big problem. No matter people sell the concept of digital as a panacea, it is not a panacea. It is increasing in many cases inequalities, uh, and not only because of the cost, also because of the literacy, but also because of the content, which is not what people need. So many of the innovations you were showing can be converted into something that is at the end of the line extension services through digital delivery services. services. But the, the problem is it will make sense as long as it's relevant and the content is relevant for the farmers. The only thing that the digital component does is to convert that into a private good for the one who has the device and also make it more cost effective to delivery. For example, we tested delivery of good quality information on prices in India in the traditional way. So basically we went to places where farmers used to come together and put every day the price information of the local market. And then we also do, did an RCT, a randomized control to check what will happen if I use it through, I do it through cellular phones. The impact of both was the same because farmers took the, the information and improved and reduced the transaction costs and improved their profits. But the advantage of the digital side that was that for me was very cheap and cost effective just using an Excel sheet and the list of, of, of the providers of the telephones that I was going to send the message on the prices. Every morning I just press a button and I can deliver it to 10,000 farmers. While in the collection places, I have to send people to put these prices in the boards and that was very expensive. So it's cost effectiveness in the delivery. And that's how we need to see these, these digital technologies and how we need to, to approach to them. But those constraints are there uh, and applies to many things because I can provide a solution for, for, for Locus or I can provide a solution for the full army warm. But sometimes that solution is out of the budget of the farmer. Sometimes that solution is not understood by the farmer because they don't have the, the skill sets to be able to, to understand. And sometimes that solution is not necessarily appropriate to the problem that they have uh, in place. Now, what, what are the opportunities? No, And many of these innovations will have opportunities. But what we need is to find ways in which we can map those opportunities to what is really the problem that you're trying to solve. But that's that's the core part. Is that the, 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 the opportunity and the solution I am bringing solves a problem and not the reverse. So it has to be demand-driven in, in most of the cases. And in the case of digital, uh, we know that it helps to reduce asymmetry of information of prices. It helps also to reduce access and improve access to finance. Today, digitally, I can score a credit of SME in the rural areas and provide them access to credit. It also creates platforms that I can sell, part of the e-commerce, but also blockchains allow us to do traceability and some of the innovations that you mentioned were on traceability. So we need to try to find ways in which we can take those benefits. But again, I am resolving a problem. I am not bringing with a solution to something which is not there. And the problem will vary, and how we need to adjust the content will vary. If I provide to the farmer a price, which is the wholesale market price, the farmer found it useless. What he needs is the price of the market where he sells, he or she sells. And they need the variety of what he or she produces. And that what's the price of that variety. So it's really important to have that in mind when we design uh, these, these technologies. So in digital, what we need to do is to find infrastructure, soft and hard, which is inclusive. We create human capital development. We create the standards. And we create innovation. And also, we need to have the hard infrastructure in place. In digital, for example, the work is being done with the Broadband Commission is to provide universal access which is central because that will allow everybody to have capacity of access, could be in different qualities, but at least they can get benefits of those technologies. But again, thinking on the cost effectiveness of the transmission. But what we have learned in any innovation, not only in digital, is that if the innovation is not attached to complements, these institutional issues that need to be resolved, it will end in concentration, one provider or two providers of that technology, it will exacerbate inequalities and it will end in control. When what we want, if we bring those complements, is innovation, efficiency, and inclusion. So if I bring a digital solution and that digital solution has certain constraints and certain requirements, I will end in more inequality. 
clearly few will benefit from it. Not only that, the cost of that technology will be lowered because only one will be supplied. And that's barriers of entry to that technology. And of course, it will end in contrast. So those complements, which are innovations in institutions, are central, like institutional innovation, regulation, any technology on improved seats requires institutions, requires certain standards to be complied so that they can be used properly and we avoid this type of control. And that goes from the most sophisticated gene editing technology to the most simple change that we can try to do. To, we need to release those constraints. Now, the key principles in rural infrastructure transformation, rural digital rural transformation is capacity, content, and context. It has to be simple, sustainable, and it has to have a system approach because it has to take into account the consequences of what it brings. I saw a lot of innovations in what you presented, but for example, I didn't see too much of the cost effectiveness of what you presented. And that's essential. If we don't have cost effectiveness, then why I will force a farmer to do something? Or if I don't have the market responding to that innovation, why I will do a farmer to do something? Long time ago, I, I was involved when I was in the CIR on, 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 on solving the problem of aflatoxins, no? which is this fungus that may have when it's, it has humidity and which is cancerigenous. It affects your liver, creates liver cancer, and also affects uh, your, your life. Uh, so aflatoxins is something that you cannot observe and you need to test it normally, and the test is expensive still. Now, if a farmer invests in creating aflatoxin-free grain by investing in the test or investing in new varieties uh, that, like AfloSafe, for example, which is a new variety that was created by IATA, and he gets to the market and the market doesn't pay the premium for that investment, why he will do it? Why he will adopt that innovation? So it's not that innovation is right or good, it's that the market is not recognizing the difference between a farmer that that investment to get the aflatoxin-free and a farmer that does no investment and gets exactly the same revenue. So we have to be comprehensive. We have to take into account the system and not just the site of the producer. So in all of these innovations, I have seen enormous amount of innovations in food losses, for example. And I am shocked because normally we see all the food losses is about post-harvest and storage. And I'm sorry to say, but when we really measure systematically across the value chain, the problems are pre the post-harvest part, are pre-harvest. They are not post-harvest. Post-harvest is a consequence that I didn't treat my grain in the correct way. It's a consequence that I put my grain in, in, in hermetic bags, but with not the correct humidity. It's a consequence that my, my soils were already infested and therefore I transferred that to the storage. So if we don't do that systemic analysis, we won't be resolving the problem. And yes, we could create a lot of silos which end being used for something else and not for storing food. So we need to be very careful in, in, in these innovations and we need to bring the cost component to it and we need to bring the supply and the demand side, not only the supply side. If not, we could end in innovations that look great, but nobody will adopt them because the market doesn't value that. So it's really important to start thinking on those things. So today we have a challenge of fertilizers in the world. It's amazing to see that significant amount of the fertilizers that we apply today is wasted because of the lack of soil mass. It's a very simple innovation. It's not even an innovation. We have been doing soil maps for long. Of course, technologies today allow me to do soil maps in a faster way. I can deploy in three, four months soil maps of the top layer of soil very quickly, and I can make them digital and give farmers with the GPS location what type of blending they need if I know the crop, and I can measure the difference between what the soil has and what the crop needs. Okay, but those things are not happening, are not happening at the velocity that should happen, even when we have a huge problem of fertilizer prices. And people are thinking in other dramatic changes, like using hydrogen or converting everything to organic, when the solution could be simple. If we know that around 50 to 30% is wasted because we don't know what to apply and we do blendings which are incorrect, let's deploy soil maps, improve the information of what blending you need, and that will reduce the demand in a significant amount. But we don't do it. And that's a simple innovation. So again, I think it's essential to, to, to carefully assess and bring the cost effectiveness of what we do. Now, the strategy that we need to have in mind when we talk about innovation is data. Data is crucial. Solid data, good data to drive what we are trying to do. To identify the problem properly, to identify how that can be resolved. 
The tools will also be essential, but they will be just tools. We need to have good content, good quality of information, good solutions to the problem. Let's never assume that the farmer is irrational. The farmer is rational under the constraints that they have. They live under constraints, therefore the choices could be different to what we will believe is a rational choice. And we need to take into account that behavior because it's what they can do with the constraints they have. If we measure, for example, uh, the discount rate of a farmer in a poor area, significantly higher than the discount rate of a guy in an urban area. So a farmer will prefer to have the money in the pocket today than twice or three times the money tomorrow because they need the money today. That's their constraint. That does not mean that they are irrational. It means that they are very rational. They are taking into account their discount rate. So all those informations are central. And that's why capacity building is also central so that they use properly. But one of the challenges also is what will be the trade-offs of that technology, of that innovation. Automation, for example, could have a trade-off in labor markets. There will be winners and losers. We will need to create capacities to achieve that, to avoid those, those trade-offs. So we need to be prepared to understand what are the trade-offs that those innovations will take. It's, all our actions have a consequence, and we need to, to understand those consequences. We cannot assume that it's just the positive side. If I use more intensification, I will have an environmental trade-off. If I use automation, I will have a trade-off in terms of the labor market. So how I can minimize those? And that's where we need to look at, in the case of digital, for example, we need to look at what will be the employment loss, which will be the remaining employment in, in the old sectors, and how I can build capacities in the meantime with new employment so that I can compensate those losses. And what institutions I need to have in place to help those losers, those are the ones that will lose because of this adoption of technologies. So again, this is an amazing world of, of changes. FAO is moving in an accelerated way with the innovation strategy that we have just approved. Uh, and, and our goal is, is to work with accelerators. We have accelerators on data, innovation, technology, and complements. So thank you so much for, for, for the opportunity. Uh, and what has been a, a great pleasure to hear some. Sorry I couldn't be the whole day, but more than happy to, to keep collaborating with you. Thank you. Back to you. Maximo, thank you so much for... Uh for your, your reflective points. Uh, I would just like to highlight some of them. Um, the first one is that indeed f the future is uncertain and we need innovation and science to be able to back up the decisions that we're making. I also um, like to highlight what you mentioned about the silver linings of COVID-19 and how it has accelerated digital transformation, but we need to ensure also that that digital transformation and that which includes also e-commerce is uh, it's been uh, an inclusive digital transformation um very relevant what you mentioned about the different uses and applications of geospatial and remote sensing technologies fao ifat and other partners we we just published um last year and also this year uh catalogs on uh, the applications and tools of uh, geospatial and remote remote sensing technologies not only as it applies to the different projects and how it can be used in our in, in our initiatives with uh, small scale farmers in the field, but also how they can assist our own agencies to improve uh, targeting, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, I fully agree with uh, your statement that our common goal is to make precision farming accessible and affordable to small scale farmers. But most importantly, we need to make sure that everything that we develop is relevant to small scale, small scale farmers. So um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that. There is one thing that you mentioned before um, when you were uh, showing the graphics of uh, the market failures in food and agriculture. And I think it's really important also to understand the amount of work that goes behind addressing those market failures. Um, FAO just held uh, recently the World Food Forum and I thought it was very interesting how uh, it grouped three three main initiatives: the the FAO and Science Forum, the um, um, attracting and uh, and supporting youth-led innovation, but also the hand-in-hand -hand initiative, um, the the platform and the investment forum. Uh, I think that is really important that the our community and our partners understand how important it is to find financing to develop all these different elements that uh, help us to address those market failures. Um, last, and, and, a, and a contribution from my side, um, on the strategy that you were describing on data tools and the capacity building, I think that uh, one, one thing that I would add is something that also some of our 
partners in the projects that uh, we're presenting today mentioned repeatedly is in addition to capacity building, we also need access to finance because the small scale farmers remain unable to access finance. So, and it's, it's key that we are able to provide timely financing to their ideas and their initiatives. We have run out of time, but uh, before we close uh, today's event, I would like to thank our hosts, Innovazione per lo Sviluppo, Cariplo Foundation, Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation, Cariplo Factory, and uh, Jenga Lab. Thank you to our institutional leaders, Claudia Sorlini of Fondazione Cariplo, Francesco Profumo of Fondazione Compagnia San Paolo, and Carlo Mango of Cariplo Factory. And to our great keynote speakers today, Caroline Legro of WFP, Amelica, Amelia Koch of uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and Maximo Torero of FAO. Thank you also to the amazing teams that presented today and to the great team working behind this, the screens today. Simone Sala, Marco, Loca Marco Catanio, Lina Guglielmini, Carmen Cancellari, Eleonora Brignoli, and Alessandro Mascioli. Special thanks to you, our audience, for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye.